Good morning and welcome again to the watershed based planning session. Our first presentation this morning is the Shell Creek, a tough nut to crack. And it will be given by Carla McCullough, who we'd like to welcome back to the stage, and Mr. Elbert Trailer, both with Nebraska DEQ. A few notes on Elbert. He, is, uh, he was the Information Education Coordinator for Nebraska Nonpoint Source Management Program from 1991 through 1995, and the Nonpoint Source Coordinator from 95 to 2010. His current duties include coordinating interagency efforts to develop and implement basin level and watershed level management plans and project implementation plans. With that, we'll turn it over to Carla and Elbert. <laughs> yeah, okay, excellent. Good morning. Um, so yeah, at the end of the conference, after we've seen so many presentations, I was thinking, how do we make this um, worth your while of being here and happy to be here at 8.30. Um, it reminded me of why we even submitted this story. We think at Nebraska, um, in our non-point source program, this is one of our best stories um, and, and unique to Nebraska in, in a lot of ways. I know it, our culture um, in our state, in certain parts of our state in particular, um, we really don't get spontaneous um, watershed groups forming and um, approaching us to do projects. It's really not it's not really our paradigm. Um, this is a story of a watershed group that formed on their own, approached us. Similar to some other stories I heard, their actual concern was flooding. Um, but we approached, I mean, basically that's what they wanted to do, but we said we can't really fund it in that way, but we can do lots of things that could abate that flooding over a longer term. Um, and then another really unique part of this is that we don't really have a, a strong citizen science component to our program, and this was, um, is the story of the right people at the right time, and there was a, a, more or less a, a spontaneous citizen science thing that happened because of an amazing high school teacher. Um, also, it was unique because we do listed the stream um, because we were able to bring atrazine levels down. So that's unique to our state, and I think fairly unique nationwide. Um, another thing is that it's a long-term project. Albert, the founding father, really, of our program in Nebraska, one of my mentors, um, and this is one of his longest-term projects. It's, he's been working on it basically over 15, 15 to 18 years, 20 years, all right. Um, and I really call this his baby, so I'm really excited for Albert and for all of us that um, it's extra sweet to see this delisting. Um, and what I think the, one of the most exciting parts of this president or the story is is how we celebrated the success and um, the press conference that we where we got basically um, EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt, um, Governor Ricketts, um, Region 7 Administrator Jim Gulliford to leave a vacation and, and show up in a small town in, in Nebraska in the first hot, hot week in June. Um, and our state conservationist, Craig Derrickson, our NDEQ director, Jim Macy, all showed up for a press conference out in the middle, basically of a cornfield by a creek. Um, and there are a lot of details we could, we could give, but you know, one warning is it's one thing to have a press conference, but it's another thing to have a press conference with dignitaries and all the security detail. Um, so that it would have been a really good reality TV show for a, a week or two. So really, just quickly, the basics. Um, this watershed is really not very far away from that Brazil project that I presented on earlier. Northeast Nebraska, the soils are not as sandy. Um, it's a long, linear watershed, really homogeneous. Um, as far as, you know, when you're looking at modeling and load reductions and such, it was, it was really, we felt like ultimately we would have to treat the whole watershed. I mean, target in increments, and that's part of the story too. Um, it is also dominated like the Bazil project and row crop, um, a little more pasture perhaps in this area. High, highly erodible land, unstable banks, um, and really a record of really low adoption rates of BNPs in this area. And that's why we're calling this a, a, tough, a tough nut to crack, um, really low levels of conservation. I did mention that this group had formed. They were concerned about flooding. This is a picture of Schuyler, Nebraska. This is fairly frequent. Um, so the people at the downstream end of that long linear watershed were the first people to really want to form that watershed group. Um, they had 
extensive um, stream bank erosion, really unstable um, stream system in that way. Encroachment on public infrastructure was not just Schuyler, but a lot of the bridges and um, culverts and even some of the, the streams were um, cutting into roads. And there was a chronic problem with dumping of livestock waste. Um, briefly, the water quality impairments were for aquatic life, and this is what we, um, we do listed because of the atrazine level coming down. Um, it is still listed for E. coli, unfortunately, but that is now in the second level of our watershed plan. This is more of an emphasis, keeping up with um, atrazine, but trying to emphasize more E. coli type EMPs. Um, and so basically, I mentioned this already, but there was a really strong resistance to conservation in this area, a general distrust of government, um, long-term family farms that have been there since the pioneer ages, and they really, you know, were the type of people that said, oh, I, my, it's good enough for my grandfather, it's good enough for me. So there was a lot of resistance to change. Um, generally, a lack of understanding about hydrology. Um, you know, they wanted to straighten streams. There were already some straightened streams. Um, but yet they were concerned about the upstream neighbors straightening streams because they knew that effect. So some lack of understanding, but yet enough of an understanding to know that there, um, that there was an effect from upstream downstream, and that resulted in some animosity. Um, really summarizing what we thought and what ended up being the keys to success in this, in this story were um, really supporting the local leadership. They needed to be the face of those meetings. Um, they really needed to take the lead and send out those agendas and send out things like in the end when we had our success in the press conference, we needed those people to be the one inviting people. Um, and they took that lead, which is really great. There were some really, just some really great people in the right time, in the right place. Um, mentioned that they already had a nine element plan. They're on their second round now. They did sub watershed rotation over the long term. We coordinated conservation programs with NRCS, um, between funding as far as BMP implementation. NRCS would generally get about 75% of the cost share. We would supplement that with 319 um, and the NRD funds and, and landowners cost for the BMP. Um, inter interim monitoring was really huge for us to show this group that we are actually making progress. There were meetings where people would be Carl, the character Carl, who was like, we're not getting a expletive thing done here, and then we came back with charts um, showing that the levels were actually going down, and because of some of the BMPs like no-till, um, that ultimately some of the, the, um, the flooding seemed to be reduced. So um, Albert will talk a little bit more about this, but that, that citizen science thing that came up with a high school teacher, it ended up, it's still going on, and it's getting awards in Nebraska um, for being a really a good model for engaging students. A lot of the students that went through um, what they called Shell Creek summers, they would spend voluntary hours. Um, and, and the high school teacher was also volunteering, but they got um, hot kits and, and really basic um, testing supplies for free for the most part or through funding um, through the grant. And they would collect this data. Now we're not, we weren't using these, this data. They wanted it simple. It wasn't, it wasn't something we were using for the IR, but this group would um, give a presentation once a year at the high school, um, and they were living out in this landscape. So they were taking this information home to their parents too, and I think this was really important um, for the success of this story. Um, and we'll talk more about that celebrating success with the, with the um, press conference. And now it's for Albert. As, as Carla said, this uh, Shell Creek Watershed Improvement Group formed in 1999, uh, initially focused on flooding. Um, they, they really had this problem of downstream people complaining about the upstream people, the straightening of the creeks that they'd done, the, the poor management they were doing on the farms, giving runoff, causing this flooding. The people upstream were sick and tired of being accused. So they, they got the group together, got members up and down the entire watershed to sit down, talk this out, and figure out what they could do. Uh, brought me in to help them in about 2002. Um, one of the things I, I gave them three pieces of advice is one, flooding is not something that you're going to get funding for. Uh, they, they absolutely were adamant they did not want to do the typical things like build flood control reservoirs. Uh, they wanted to do conservation work, so 
I was able to work with them there and say, well, let's change the focus from flooding to conservation, and now you've opened up a whole stream of new funding, and you'll get the flooding benefits, flood control benefits with the kind of practices you're doing for, for conservation anyway. So it's kind of that co-benefits thing we've been talking about. Uh, so they believed me on that. The other thing they wanted to do is they didn't want anybody left out, so they wanted to have the whole watershed, 300, almost 305,000 acres. And so my advice was nobody is going to let you have a couple hundred dollars and throw Band-Aids at 300 plus thousand acres because uh, we have to be responsible for getting things done and, and showing success. So I needed to have them scope it down into something manageable. Uh, and the other thing is we need a plan so everybody's on the same page. So they, they accepted changing to conservation, but they wouldn't give up on the idea of the whole 300,000 acres. They applied for some grants, didn't get them, got their attention. So then they really started focusing, helping us write a plan. Uh, we use this group really part of to really help them better understand the impact of land management on the stream, the, the pollution runoff, the water runoff, and to understand what the impacts of the stream modification were. Uh, we use in our new plan, we've kind of adapted the idea of watershed ambassadors. So this is our group, we educate them, let them go talk to their neighbors. Uh, so when you get the neighbor complaining about this doesn't work or that doesn't work, they know what they're doing. So I'm getting the, the signals here. We let this group absolutely drive this project. So they make the decisions, we provide funding. Actually, every project they have to go to SWIG first to get approved. Um, we developed our management plan in 2005 and 15. Uh, we have the citizen advisory group, which is SWIG, the technical people, which is the conservation agencies. Uh, we very much take an advisory role, not a leading dictating role to them. We got broad input on the plan so people knew what was going on, and then we got them to shift the focus. Now, to get around this idea that we got to treat everybody fair, uh, we came up with the idea of a sub-basin rotation, divided it into 10 sub-watersheds, and we would work on one or two at a time for a two-year period, and then we'd move to the next watershed and overlap these so as one was closing in their last year, a new one was opening in their first year. And, and everybody accepted that. They knew they were going to have to wait maybe eight years, ten years for the program to get to them, but at least they knew it was coming. Uh, so that kind of reduced that idea that we have to do everything at once. This lets us put a lot of practices in a small place at, at one time, get some results. Uh, and also in a typical project, it takes a couple of years to get people used to the idea to come in and sign up. The fact that these people next door knew that they were on deck next year, they were ready to enroll right away. Uh, the, uh, we developed the State Water Quality Initiative, which provided us about a million dollars a year of EQIP funds. Started this back in 2005. This is the first place that we implemented this. So we could literally sit down with the farmer at their kitchen table decide what they were going to do and tell them what their funding was going to be and where it was going to come from. Um, we're continuing, that was kind of a precursor to the National Water Quality Initiative. Um, we still do this, so we get a million dollars in the State Water Quality Fund and 1.2 million in the National Water Quality Fund, so uh, kind of sweet. Uh, we had some flexibility of trying to target people to do the right things. Uh, we made everything eligible, but we only gave them ranking points for particular practices that are addressing the pollutants that we wanted to do. Uh, we did some experimental things. Rather than take the typical approach of saying, we'll give you a 25% bonus on the cost share, we would say, what, we'll give you cost share for five years instead of three years. And, and that was enormously popular. It really reduced the recidivism of people doing it for three years and then going back to normal tillage. Uh, we did a thing called Lands for Conservation. So for structural practices, we have a short construction season. Uh, we, we rent their land, our strip of land, uh, for the season. So that land, that strip of land has to be available August 1st. 
so we get a, a longer construction season. And one, we had some practices people were really uncomfortable with, and so we provided them cost share for consultant to really help them calibrate their equipment, get the stuff put in the field, and so forth. This turned out to be really important. Uh, as Carla said, Carl got up one day, we were about three quarters of the way through the plan, and he just said, we haven't accomplished a thing. And absolutely shocked us, because we're looking from the outside, seeing all the great stuff they were doing. They were looking on the inside, saying, we know how many things we approved a year. So I had some data run, uh, and what we realized was we weren't giving them feedback in a graphical manner that they could clearly understand. So I came up with this, ran the data, and found you can see there's the one vertical line, 2005, when we started implementation. Uh, we had concentrations up to 115 parts per, uh, or micrograms per liter. Uh, after we started the project, we started seeing those peak heights come down. We, we didn't change the number of violations, but the concentrations were coming down. And eventually, in the last two years, uh, we, we achieved uh, no, no hits and delisted. This really energized them. From then on, it was like people sitting on the edge of their seat in the last game of the World Series tied one-to-one -one in the bottom of the ninth. Uh, they really wanted to get to zero, uh, and we got them there. Um, intergenerational, as I've always believed that the real changes in non-point source were going to come with the generational change. Um, and refer to Linda Hall made the comment, you know, in the last few years we've seen this huge increase in success stories. Think about it, we've been doing this for 28 years. We're dealing with the second generation now. And we're finding we're getting a lot better participation, a lot faster uh, participation. Uh, teachers worked with this uh, group of kids, and these have been our best ambassadors. Uh, they monitor the stream every year. They present to the SWIG group, to the, to the NRD board. We targeted those beginning farmers, and we targeted that next generation. But we found, as Carla said earlier in, in her talk, the average age of farmers is 57. Um, we've got a lot of these farmers are approaching retirement, their landlords are in retirement to get them to invest in particularly structural conservation is gonna cut into their retirement funds. Uh, so it's really that next generation that's making the big changes. So we really focused on that. Uh, we did the big press conference, uh, it was a great idea. I promised these guys we were gonna make a big deal out of this when they got there. Uh, and then, as we started planning it, thought, well, it might be neat, neat to invite the governor. I thought, okay, that's fine. Well, maybe we could get somebody from Region 7. Uh, turns out we get the regional administrator. Uh, and somehow, I don't know how this happened, but we got a phone call. Actually, I got a phone call from Shui Group and said, I got a phone call from Washington that they're sending a security detail to inspect the shed where we're gonna have the party. What is going on? Uh, I don't know. I went back and said, oh, by the way, Scott Pruitt's gonna show up for the press conference. So uh, anyway, it was a big deal. We got a lot of press coverage. Uh, and finally, what we're seeing is the kids are finding that they're getting reduced E. coli levels. Um, CTIC did a, a survey of this area back in 2005 Conservation tillage was at 15%. NRCS repeated this in, 19, in, in 2015. We're up to 85%. Uh, we've noticed sort of anecdotally a decrease in severity of flooding. Uh, again, we've taken that now. We're on our second plan. Uh, and the real value of this is these people now value this as a resource. Uh, the people say, you know, I fished and swam in that creek when I was seven years old. My grandkids can do that now, so. Uh, so this is now no longer the sewer, but a real uh, um, asset for that community. And we have a, in the midst of all of this chaos, um, our boss came down and said, we'd like you to do a video to submit to ECOS. 
And so we had 30 days to do this. And so we did this little video that Carla's going to show you. Um, Albert wasn't going to probably say this, but um, he's into theater and script writing and continues to take classes and um, enter his, his um, scripts and stuff like that. Anyway, so this was a perfect match for putting together this press conference, giving all the dignitaries a script, which they some followed to some degree. Um, <laughs> And then putting a script together for this video, which we're really happy about. It really kind of upped our outreach game. And you'll get to hear some really cool regional accents. Once, its banks were lined with shells, a testament to the teeming aquatic community it supported. But decades of channelization and poor farming practices led to flooding, erosion, and pollution. Atrazine levels chronically exceeded water quality standards. The fish and mussels disappeared. Shell Creek was dying. I used to fish in Shell Creek when I was five, six years old, and it has deteriorated, and we were looking for ways to improve it and get it back to a normal flow. Under the leadership of the Shell Creek Watershed Improvement Group, local, state, and federal conservation agencies developed and implemented a watershed management plan to restore Shell Creek. We also believe that local people solve local problems, and this is a perfect example of what a good group of environmental stewards, government officials, or federal partners can accomplish when we all work together. This approach to help local leaders advance the adoption of conservation practices that worked for them and helped to achieve common environmental goals. The water's starting to slow down now, and the no-till has made a big difference for us down here. Thanks to the dedicated work of the Shell Creek Improvement Group and the support of local, state, and federal conservation agencies, life is returning to Shell Creek, leaving a legacy for future generations to build on. Everyone that has ever been a part of this project has learned things that they have taken with them for the rest of their life. Sean Ferrier, a 2008 graduate of Newman Grove School, stated, once I, I was able to work on the Shell Creek, I realized that science was the world right outside my front door. That's it. Hi. Thank you. Great presentation. Really exciting. At the beginning, I thought I heard that you said this group self-formed. And then if you could talk a little bit about that and then what led you to connecting with them and okay. meeting. Yeah, this, uh, it, there was a group of farmers just really frustrated that crops were being flooded out, people in the town were being flooded out, um, and there was just constant arguments. A lot of the upper watershed had been channelized and Farmers downstairs, downstream basically would hire a contractor to build a berm, a levee along the creek. None of this was engineered. Uh, the neighbor, of course, then next year would hire a contractor and put a levee on his side, and the two farmers downstream the following year would put a levee on their side. So we have this makeshift levee stacking water up. They were breaking all the time, flooding. Uh, and NRCS at the time had an intern that was kind of working on watershed planning and communication and so forth. So she started working with the group and, you know, sit down and quit arguing and start finding solutions. So uh, that's where they really went out and recruited people from both ends of the watershed, sat down and said, let's, let's work together. We have a common problem. Let's solve this. So, you know, their point was, let's go out and get money and fix it. Well, there was no plan to do that. And we had been working with our natural resource districts on watershed planning and so forth. So uh, that's where I got called in and said, let's come meet with this group and see if we can help them. Uh, but yeah, they formed their own group, uh, very active. We're very sensitive not to step on their toes. Uh, that's why I said, you know, even though we had this pool of money, or people that wanted to participate, we made them go to SWIG and basically present what they wanted to do. And then the SWIG group would agree to do it or not do it or prioritize it, and then they would come to us to, to fund it. So we, we kept them 
right out in front being the, the, the voice and the face of this project, which kept them energized. They felt like it was important. Hi, have you um, been able to collect any information about the impact on the flooding? I mean, has that been part of the success story? Um, most of that is anecdotal. Uh, the people are saying they're not getting as much flooding. Uh, one of my colleagues from NRCS did kind of a back of the napkin calculation of looking at the gauge heights at the, the uh, USGS station and looking at rainfall and we had an event uh, 19, about 1990 was a major flood. I mean, it it sent cars into the to the stream and blocked the channels and did a lot of damage. Uh, by his calculation, in the the flood that we had in 11, uh, we actually had more rain than the 1990 storm, but the the heights, the peak heights of the stream were not as high. I, I, I have been trying in the last year or so to get somebody at the university to actually analyze that data and give us a, a statistically valid observation, but at least from what the people in the watershed are saying, it's, there's not as much flooding and it's not as severe when they have it. And ironically, after this press conference two weeks later, they had a flood that that, that site was almost underwater, uh, but it, it went right back into the stream the next day and there was absolutely no damage to the work that we had done there, so. Um, did I hear you say that y'all offered um, increased cost share rates if they signed up for a longer practice life? Uh, no, it was just the opposite. The, the typical thing we would do, NRCS was paying 50% with EQIP funds, we would typically at 25% with 319 to get them to 75. Uh, the NRD, and we have an environmental trust fund um, grant, and they would give them another 10% or so to get the producer up to about 15 or 20% contribution. Uh, what we did uh, for the field practices, no-till was kind of the big thing we pushed. Well, the typical thing would be to say, okay, they got $10 an acre for three years to do no-till, and what we decided was rather than give them $15 a year for three years, we would give them the $10, but we'd do it over five years. So it actually ended up being cheaper for us. And that really came out of a study that Purdue University did years ago that there was almost an 80% recidivism of people doing no-till on three years and they have to do one year on their own. Uh, and then 80% would go back to conventional tillage. And, they, and I'll explain that. If they kept them in for five years, those numbers flipped. 80% would stay in it. And the reason for that is when you're doing no-till, if you're doing conventional tilling, you till that debris back into the soil. It degrades that year. The nitrogen is available. If you're doing no-till, it takes three years for that crop to completely degrade and the nitrogen to go back in the soil. So if, if producer is a pretty good manager on his fertilizer anyway, he's gonna see a yield dip in that second and third year. And the fourth year he does grudgingly on his own and bails out. If you keep him in there five years, that yield return comes back in the fourth and fifth year and they'll stay with the practice. So it was, it was hugely successful in this watershed. And as many people said, we paid them for like 160 acres and they put in 500. Um, so. All right, will you both be around during the break because there were a few more questions. Yes, yes we'll be here. All right, thank you again. <laughs> Next, we would like to welcome Meg Hennessy of the New Mexico Environment Department. Meg is a project manager for the Watershed Protection Bureau of the New Mexico Environment Department. Her specialty is overseeing development and implementation of watershed-based plans, as well as managing riparian restoration projects funded by the state. Meg's presentation today is on community sourced efforts in watershed based planning, obstacles, and opportunities. Welcome, Meg. Hi, everyone. So, 
Switching themes a little bit from the last few days, I'm going to get into telling the story of one particular watershed-based plan and how it fits into the context of New Mexico's program. So in New Mexico, we have a requirement that any 319 implementation projects do need to exist under the coverage of a nine element plan. We are switching into starting out doing two watershed-based plans as TMDL alternatives, and I'll get more into that later. Um, this was primarily in case there are folks here who are not familiar with the nine element plan after listening for the last couple of days, I'm pretty sure you all are, right? Anybody, raise their hand if you have questions, right? No, okay, good. So in New Mexico, this is largely our process. We have our monitoring team that starts assessing waters on an eight-year rotation, and then impaired waters get a TMDL developed, and then we move into the watershed-based planning process and into restoration and implementation. Pretty standard, right? Everybody kind of works on this same idea. Well, we were finding that um, out of the relatively small pool of New Mexico's contractors and restoration specialists, we were getting kind of a bottleneck right around the watershed-based planning process. The plans that had been, in, had been approved were quickly being implemented and we were running out of projects. Meanwhile, we have a tremendous amount of the state that is not covered by a nine element plan. And for those who are not familiar with New Mexico, it's a, the fifth largest state, but has a very small population and mostly centered into two cities, Santa Fe and Albuquerque. And of course, you're probably familiar with this, but in New Mexico, watershed-based plans largely address the issues of sedimentation, erosion, similar to the ones we've heard before. Also, catastrophic wildfire risk is a major risk in New Mexico, and many communities are very much concerned with the overgrowth of forests due to decades of fire suppression. As well, we largely deal with um, loss of riparian habitat due to rangeland grazing and temperature impairments that come from high solar loading. It's a very warm state with a lot of sun. <laughs> and our high quality cold water fisheries in the mountains are very sensitive to the loss of vegetation. Okay, so in New Mexico, largely uh, we contract out efforts to make watershed-based plans. Our 319 staff hasn't got, been in the habit of, um, of doing them in, ourselves in-house for quite a few years. We largely found that that was successful, but again, we were hitting that bottleneck. Um, and these are some of our, our groups that uh, have created them throughout the years. So a few years ago, we decided to look at what we could do to speed up this process, get more communities eligible for funding. And as I was saying, in New Mexico, largely the watershed-based planning process um, usually takes between two to three years to collect the data, draft the plan, submit it to EPA, review it, resubmit it. It can cost anywhere from $50,000 to $200,000. That's kind of the high end. Um, and we were finding that we were just really hitting too big of a time gap, a time lag between when we uh, listed a water as impaired and when we could actually get to implementing projects to do something about it. So we decided to try a new strategy with this thing called the Rio Puerco Watershed Based Plan. Um, I, with some consultation with my colleagues and with the help of the Rio Puerco Management Committee, wrote the plan in-house with no funding other than my staff time and our volunteer hours. Um, it was much faster than our usual process. It took 12 months to complete, three months for EPA to review, and then for me to revise it and get it up to snuff and get it accepted. And it was accepted by EPA, by Brian Fontenot in the back over there, um, earlier this year in January. Um, 
And we're very happy to say that as of this past fall, we have an on-the-ground implementation project moving forward. So if we had gone the usual route of contracting it out, we would still be creating the plan. So obviously you can see the benefits of doing it this way. Um, the process. I know that I've spoken to a few of you here who have done this in-house watershed-based planning efforts um, yourself, and it sounds kind of similar, perhaps a little different. Can I see a show of hands? Who's written an in-house watershed-based plan? Nice, nice. Okay, so there's a few people who haven't. Um, in New Mexico, we, uh, there is, a, as I said, a huge amount of area to cover. And usually there are many, many stakeholders that we need to talk with. Uh, this is common without, throughout the country. So we started out by just going to the watershed groups that had TMDLs in place, that were active and had a really tight connection with their communities. We also uh, prioritized ones with completed WAP watershed wraps, watershed restoration action strategies, which were the precursors to the nine element plan in many ways. Uh, the one we wound up selecting, Rio Puerco, had a very complete, very thorough re watershed restoration action strategy. So that made it a lot easier to just add in the quantitative loading analysis and, and get it submitted as fast as possible. But ultimately, the candidate was chosen by how active the local watershed group was and how supportive they were. This is a voluntary process, as everyone else has. And we wound up going with the Rio Puerco um, just north, sorry, looking at these things, uh, just north and west of Albuquerque, which some of you may know where that is. It's right smack dab in the middle of New Mexico. Um, and out of those, we prioritized the two streams, the Rio de las Vacas up here, or sorry, I'm sorry, the Rio Puerco, not that, um, and Blue Water Creek, um, which were the ones that were some of the most impaired in the region. So we started out with a goal of addressing those two regions as our, our primary focuses. The Rio Puerco watershed is six and a half million acres, so obviously we can't cover all of it with just uh, a few years of funding. And for those of you who went to the poster session yesterday, uh, Dan Guevara presented on a previous success story that was on Blue Water Creek, and we really wanted to build on that and expand that to best leverage and use our limited funds. And this is a map of the land ownership throughout the Rio Puerco watershed. As you can see, this is why it's so crucial to have stake owner, stakeholder buy-in. Um, in six and a half million acres, there are several different soil and water conservation districts, several different tribes, and we obviously couldn't just come in and approach everyone on our own. Luckily for us, there is something called the Rio Puerco Management Committee, which was created by a federal omnibus bill almost 30 years ago. It has members from all the tribes, all the local communities, the soil and water conservation districts. They've been very, very active. And in fact, Dorothy Redhorse from Navajo EPA. Dorothy, you want to stand up and give away? Um, she was a key member. Uh, let's give her a hand. Dorothy drove many hours to be at every single meeting and was a key member of this watershed-based plan. She should really be up here presenting with me, and I'll have her up here for questions at the end. Um, so the Rio Puerto Management Committee had this long history of working in the region. They were the one that wrote the Watershed Restoration Action Strategy, but because of a lack of funding, they had sort of started to die off. There were fewer people attending the meetings and they hadn't had a project on the ground in a while. So we thought that this planning effort was a great opportunity to revive this group and keep it going for the next generation. 
So basically what our role was to, was to provide the quantitative load analysis, which the stakeholders had pretty much done all of the other elements of the, of the watershed base plan, but lacked the technical expertise to complete this on their own. And we used the EPA models like Steppel, but also one called SIAC. Has anyone heard of that? Raise your hand. Come on, I can't. Thank you. Yeah, Alan, you're <laughs> my fellow New Mexicans have. Um, SIAC is uh, quite accurate, even though it seems um, a little more off the cuff because it was developed to be used by people without a technical background. In New Mexico, we also struggle with having models that are designed for other parts of the country um, that are not as accurate for our high desert dry environment. Uh, models that are designed for Virginia or the Northeast are just not going to be as accurate. Um, and SIAC has actually had some interesting ground truthing come out of Tehran to also use it in desert environments. And it's shown that even though it's quite easily accessible and any person, regardless of their education or their background, can read the instructions and go out and fill out the forms and get a rough idea of how much sediment is coming off their landscape, it's actually surprisingly accurate and it's a great place to start. We're going to ground truth it and update our loading estimates as we actually do more monitoring. But a big restriction on this plan was that we didn't have funding to do any on the ground monitoring. We had to start out with estimates. Um, and so, a key part of the success of this region was that we chose streams that had impairments that had easily understandable models. Um, any models I found for looking at E. coli were much more difficult for lay people to understand. And in a rural area of New Mexico, we're just not going to get anything done if people don't feel that they are able to understand and participate in the process. Um, again, the, one of the big reasons why this plan took so much less time than previous planning efforts was that a huge amount of the work had already been done by the Rio Puerco Management Committee. Their RAS included their preferred BMPs. They had already done outreach to the stake owners, stakeholders that um, would want to implement these BMPs on their land. And the RAS had already included education and outreach goals, and the Rio Puerco Management Committee was actively carrying out that outreach. So several of the elements of the nine element plan were already in place and ready to go. Of course, it was not without drawbacks. Um, can people in the back actually read that? Probably not. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not a big fan of reading off slides, but I'll tell you it. Uh, the pros to this approach, like I said, high levels of stakeholder investment meant that there was immediately follow-up for to apply for these funds, and we had a project on, going forward for on-the-ground work just a few months after the plan was accepted. Um, the NMED staff, myself, writing the plan in-house meant there was much less time from TMDL development to implementation on the ground. Um, we had a lot of learning experiences that are invaluable for writing future in-house plans. Again, our section hadn't done this in, a, in quite some time. It used to be old hat, but um, we had gotten into the habit of contracting them out. And of course, a larger amount of area, six and a half million acres, became eligible for restoration funds. Um, the cons, the lack of funds meant that we really were relying on models and our loading estimates were just that, estimates. Instead, we're going to have to rely on the monitoring requirements that we put in for any on the ground projects for pre and post project monitoring to update our watershed based plan. Of course, the good thing about that is that EPA and ourselves view a watershed based plan as a living document. It's meant to be updated with every project that you do. And of course, models are not perfect. Few are adapted to New Mexico's environment. Um, 
and the loading estimates will need to be updated in order to have meaningful tracking of our progress and in order to predict when these impaired streams can be delisted. Um, and one of the things I'd like to talk about with folks here while we have everyone um, uh, from around the country is working on two watershed-based plans as TMD alternatives. This is new for us. Um, we'd like to get into it in order to reduce the time from TMDL implementation to on the ground work even further. And we view some, we're, we're predicting some obstacles in it. Um, our TMDL team is under certain time restraints to fulfill the consent decree and our watershed based planning section hasn't done that. Um, so I'd love to hear from people around the country who have done watershed based plans as TMDL alternatives. And in the meantime, I'd like to move on to the Q&A because we only have a few minutes left and Dorothy, you want to come on up? Um, Dorothy and I will both be willing to take questions either about creating the watershed-based plan, working with a tribal and multi-agency team, or to hear your opinions and your feedback on watershed-based plans as TMDL alternatives. Um, first off, really great presentation. Um, I'm from Virginia and um, I've actually personally, I've had the luxury, I guess, of working in two different EPA regions. I used to work for Texas. Um, and what y'all are going through is very similar to kind of where our program is at in Virginia. Um, so first of all, I'd like to know what EPA uh, staff you're working with that approved a six and a half million acre watershed based plan, because that has never happened. <laughs> Well, it should be noted that out of the six and a half million acres of the whole Rio Puerto, we were focusing on two 12 digit, uh, no, three or four 12 digit husks okay. as our priorities. So that's, that makes it a lot easier. But um, Brian, you want to stand up in the back? <laughs> yeah, blame him. <laughs> um, and then. Second, I'd like to talk to you, you know, later more about we actually have two um, watershed-based plans that we're doing as TMDL alternatives right now currently, so um, come find me later. Yeah, that would be great. Meg, did, or did you all have questions for the audience that you'd like feedback on? Well, first I'll give a moment to Dorothy to talk about the nexus with the tribal liaison. Good morning, everyone. Um, with the Rio Perco Management Committee, there are um, about six tribes that um, are part of the watershed. And uh, with the Navajo Nation, after I assume responsibility for a non-point source um, program administration, uh, so I've been attending most of the meetings and more or less it's like a liaison between the our tribe, the community groups that are within the um, watershed, and also the pebbles of Hamas, Santa Ana, Sandia, Isleta, and also Hickory Apache. They're part of the group, and I'll, they all send their representative. The difference between their group and, um, and mine is that um, they have a closed government, so everything has to be approved by the uh, council delegates or their um, governor. Whereas in my case, we have an open uh, government, so all the responsibility lies with our tribal EPA. So that makes it a lot easier for me to be involved at different levels of the planning, the watershed group. and. One community, Ohonsino, which is in, towards the northwest of the watershed, uh, they took this whole um, pollutant of sediment load into Rio Grande seriously. That they even told me that we were told that we were sending all our dirt to fill half of Elephant Butte. So that's still on their mind and 
all different ages are involved with their planning. So my uh, non-point source or 319 grants, the competitive portions, um, goes directly to that community and, um, and they are involved with the volunteer as well as the outreach. They design their own outreach as well as their project planning and we go by sections, the area that um, a rancher is uh, considering the project as a way to improve their lease area or the area that they're responsible for. So eventually it became Ojo and Sino Farmers and um, Ranchers Association. So they keep all of us on top of our toes with everything. And one thing good about this whole watershed group is that we have over three um, dozens of um, different agencies, the tribes, the um, NGOs, individuals that take this whole watershed, uh, cleaning it up, uh, its water, uh, making it uh, high uh, water quality uh, it, as a serious business. So it's really, it was an eye opener when I first joined them because uh, Ojo and Sino is the very first chapter that I came across that have been involved with this um, type of um, business since the mid-90s. So that was quite impressive. And, and we learned to deal with the state government as well as our own tribal and different places and they're at different stages with the water base plan. Thank you. We have time for two questions. Hi. Um, sounds like a really good, strong watershed planning effort. The question I have is that you began doing this plan on your own. You said because there was such a lag time in getting watershed plans done. And so I'm wondering, what is it about your doing the plan yourself that has sped up this process and allowed you to get a plan out more quickly that didn't, you know, versus your model before where I'm presuming you must have had, I don't know, a consultant or some organization that would be taking the lead on this? Well, first off, I didn't start doing it on my own. We approached several watershed groups and asked if they would be willing to uh, support us in this and if we basically asked their permission. Um, and that was a huge part of what sped it up. The watershed group meetings um, could very quickly be turned into public meetings. They could get notices out to the community very quickly. And because of the Rio Puerto Management Committee's previous work in the region, we had essentially almost half of a watershed-based plan already written. My role was really just to go in and use the data to create meaningful quantitative estimates for the problems they already knew to exist. And when it came to recommending BMPs, we went to the community and asked everybody's input on where they knew problems to exist. We brought an eight by eight map of each watershed, um, eight feet by eight feet. And then it was very easy to go out onto the ground and get it and create an estimate of how much of a load was coming off of each of those problem areas. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, part two to, the, to your question, uh, the, the leadership for our Rio Perco Management Committee was, um, I guess they were overachievers yeah. and they are uh, thinking short term and long term that they broke the committee into uh, subcommittees. So each time we met, we were giving, uh, uh, gave ourselves deadlines and when we're gonna meet. So each subcommittee had their own task to do and then we had quarterly meeting as an entire committee. So during those time, we all presented back to the 
uh, committee and water quality and uh, different groups. So we got we had uh, groups that were talking about the methodologies and then the pr projects. And the other part that also contribute to keeping our group on our toes is that um, we had two congressional representatives that sent their um, staff and they took the information back to their um, superiors. So that was the other part. And probably that our previous model included hiring a contractor who wasn't necessarily familiar with the area they were going to write a plan for other than scoping it out a few times. Um, so they had to walk the whole reach and go on go f and, do, and do a lot of uh, familiarization. We already had people who did that. But also the fact that we didn't do on the ground monitoring really sped things up. We would have preferred to take some time to do that, but um, that's one of the trade-offs. And we'll do that going forward with our projects. I just wanted to add that the in-house process also. This is Abe Franklin, my boss. So the way that Meg did this also eliminated about a year from the timeline that would have been required for the procurement for selecting a contractor. Oh, yeah. And it, it took you about a year to do the plan, whereas our, our projects, like you mentioned, are normally maybe two or three years. I'm guessing we're out of time, or no? Yes, we are, but if you would please be around, if you would both be around during the break, if there were other questions. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next up we have Rick Wilson. Yeah, Rick has a 24-year career with Ohio EPA. He is a civil engineer that's done various activities and responsibilities with Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. For the last 10 years, Rick has worked as the lead technical and engineering resource for Ohio's non-point source program. Today, Rick will be talking to us about a productive transition with the creation of a new HUC-12 scale nine element watershed based planning template and related research and outreach. So we'll welcome Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning everyone. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the NEI, NEI WPCC for organizing this event and US EPA for, for their great work through the years that I've, I've been there and, and especially region five. A lot of this all starts, a lot of what we started to do in Ohio all started with the, the program guidance that was put out by US EPA in 2013. Um, basically, it indicated that there's a strong emphasis on, on taking a watershed-based approach to restore impaired waters, but we had already known that. Uh, we had been developing what we called watershed action plans at the 10 uh, 10 digit huck scale or maybe multiple 10 digit huck scale since uh, it late, the late 90s. We probably covered almost uh, probably two thirds to three quarters of the state of Ohio with what we called watershed action plans, which was, were very large, cumbersome documents. And, and uh, if you guys remember my former boss, Russ Gibson, he always talked about we need to have skinny plans. And so we, uh, <laughs> well, I was that, I was the, I, along with a few others in our office, were the ones that were kind of tasked to make that happen. But um, so from US EPA, uh, you'll see that that basket of laundry there. I think I was thinking about the five loads I had to fold that night at home. But, it, but basically, if you ha you know what a, uh, uh, you have a you have a lot of stuff there, but you never touch it, and it, it kind of just gets stagnant, and, and you don't really want to go back and touch it again. So that's kind of what we had. That's kind of what we had with our bookshelf of watershed action plans that were, you know, kind of world peace, you know, solve world peace versus what can we do now with the funds available this year and, and go on. So with a firm direction, I would say from US EPA, uh, we moved beyond the water, watershed action planning framework. Um, and then instead we've put the focus on what needed to be done uh, at the HUC-12 scale to, to move the needle toward fixing impairment. 
uh, another item, you know, I tried to, we really did use that guidance when we put together this template. And I'm going to share the template with you. I, I didn't want to have these page after page after page uh, thing. And I was looking through my, my presentation. I think I could have gone backwards or forwards with this and, and kind of conveyed the same message. So I'm going to try to do the best I can to explain how we, how we did this. But um, non-point source control funding needs far exceed the resources appropriated. Obviously, the big push from, from headquarters and our region was we need to start showing progress toward delisting. We need to show incremental progress, success, et cetera. Um, so now when we're determining project eligibility based on the process that we developed in the nine element plans and, uh, that, that we have to date, all of our project eligibility for 319 funds is directly dependent on whether or not the project is included in a nine element uh, non-point source implementation, implementation strategy. Would you guys be okay if I call it a NIPSIS? That's what I'm going to call it from now on, the NIPSIS plan. So again, with the guide, the guide helped us focus our planning. Uh, I'm going to, I have some uh, quotes here. Planning at the watershed scale is needed to provide a comprehensive analysis of the causes and sources. That's in bold, causes and sources. We use that. Causes and sources of pollution to identify critical areas. We're, we focused on that in our template in which to give priority for conservation practices. I should have highlighted priority. Um, this approach can identify possible implementation activities. Those are projects, 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 and a, a list of objectives to, uh, to address water quality problems. Those are goals. What's our problem? We're not meeting our goals. Uh, we're not meeting our loads. We're not meeting our fish metrics, our habitat metrics, our macroinvertebrate me metrics. So those are our problems. And then prioritize uh, 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 the types of BMPs that will contribute to, to uh, delisting or achieving those goals. And we call those objectives. So you'll see those coming up here. Nine elements, uh, the guidance. Straightforward, and this is kind of how we presented it to the people that we're trying to get to write these plans. It's an effective, integrative approach to address the diverse realities. When I say diverse realities, Ohio has, is a diverse state, even though it's small compared to uh, a lot of states. We have Lake Plain soils. We have urban centers, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton. We have Appalachia, which is uh, the, the, the foothills. In southeast Ohio, where mining is an issue, so we have diverse issues, and we couldn't have a one one plan fits all type of uh, approach. So, I pulled a couple of slides out of our outreach. We've done a lot of outreach around the state at various meetings to get people interested in writing these plans, uh, get the the right stakeholders involved with writing these plans with our assistance. Um, so, what is the nine element? non-point source implementation strategy. It's a summary of watershed characteristics. And you've heard this all along throughout the week here. It's a living strategic implementation plan. Living as in with new data, the, the plan changes. With new ideas for where, where we know there are problems or critical areas, the plan will be updated. Where we get uh, new types of objectives that we know are successful or new types of BMPs, the plan will be updated. Most importantly, projects, projects, projects. We might have goals here, a list of quantifiable objectives here, and we can stack on projects. We might only know of one project that can attack those goals and objectives right now, but next year we might have two more, next month we might have two more, and you can stack those projects on. And as long as those projects include uh, the uh, criteria, the nine element criteria, they all fit together into a nice, tidy little uh, uh, nine element plan. So causes and sources of impairment, key. Developing critical areas, key. Uh, establishing strategic goals, key and objectives. So you all have seen this. I don't want to go through it, but I did underline some of the main things. Again, causes, sources, critical areas, measurable milestones. Those red flags were things that we really had to grapple with and struggle with. And I'll, I'll say when we started putting together our template for the nine element uh, 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 plan, uh, uh, we went back and forth with Region 5. Uh, Paul Thomas, Tom Davenport gave us, you know, blunt critiques on our efforts. 
and uh, we understood. Uh, it was it was clear we, we didn't we didn't beat around the bush. They didn't either, and we we really plugged and chugged. Uh, when I say we, um, Sherry Blair with our Northwest District Office, Greg Nadjib with our Department of Agriculture, Soil and Water uh, Group. Um, ag is a big part of our non-point source pollution, but so is urban, so is uh, mining, so is our, our other things. But we had to include ag in our process. Okay, so I, I didn't bring the whole template. I could have showed it to you. It's about seven pages. Um, the template, it basically says, here's what each section should have in it. Here's the amount of paragraphs you should have, not more or less than this, but this is the opening line of the template that basically gives the charge for writing these things. It's overall, this document should be written in a concise yet detailed manner, which is kind of a double thing, but anyway. Uh, using paragraphs, not pages, to convey information. When possible, it's preferred that information be incorporated in, into this document by reference with a brief explanation. Uh, stop it there. Ohio EPA does, we have databases that show where and when and what our water quality results are at, at the at GIS uh, position and, 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 uh, and it's available. We have technical support documents. We have TMDL reports. All that information is available and online. It's already in a report. Why bring it all in together again and stack it on top of each other and make everyone scratch their heads when they're trying to find the information? Why not just pull the information out in your particular hook, list it straight out, and then move on with, quite frankly, what are the goals, objectives, and projects? So. Rather, uh, so the non-point source implementation strategy is meant to closely align with Ohio's non-point source management plan update. Our management plan is due for being updated again, but largely it has a section for urban issues, stream issues, and a section for ag issues, and a section for protecting high quality streams. So when we want people to look at, here's our goals, our objectives should all align with what's in our plan, or else we obviously we can't fund it. Um, some of these plans will go outside of what non-point source would ordinarily fund, and that's fine. Uh, in fact, we kind of hope for more, especially in the ag region where, where we have uh, a lot more funding coming from USDA's NRCS with EQIP than uh, uh, EPA's non-point source funds could ever, ever fund. So there's, we've been struggling with that, and we'll probably continue to struggle a little bit more. And I'll have more on that in here in just a bit. There's a link there. Um, Y'all can probably get a hold of me anytime, any day, to, and I'll be happy to walk you through more of this. But there's a link to our, our template. It's available in PDF. It's available as a, uh, a Word document, and everyone has used that. They bring that in. That's the start of their, their process. How am I doing on time? OK. Um, we also online, we have every plan that's been uh, approved so far is published online. A lot of people have looked at what's been approved. There's been really high quality ones with great maps. There's been some that came from soil and water conservation districts that meet the needs for their situation right now. So uh, I'd be happy to point you in the, the direction of those too. This is the, I'm out here talking to watershed coordinators. This is, it's so easy, it's six simple steps. Obviously, that's not the case, but when you, when you want to bring people in, um, you want to break it down into summarize the, cause, summarize the watershed characteristics, list causes and sources around the, around the bend here, projects. So um, it, it, the, the idea is easy. Whether or not you have the information at the tip of your finger or are able to get it is another story, and that's where stakeholders really come in. So I'll go through this chapter by chapter. There's only four, so don't, don't worry about that. Um, chapter one is the introduction. Uh, of why are we doing this report? What's the watershed profile and history? Just a, a little bit of background. Or what cities are there? What type of what type of uh, you know industry is it there? What's the land use? But most important is who was involved with the public participation? Participation. <laughs> who was involved? Anyway, so <laughs> um, so. This has been kind of something that we need to revisit. Uh, a lot of times people say, okay, I have a project. I know, what the, I know the problems, I know the goals, but I have a project. Uh, and one watershed group will write the project and we say, well, did you talk to the Soil and Water Conservation District? Who was involved from the city? Who was involved from the county? Um, and a lot of times that's 
might be weak. A lot of times it's very robust and there's a lot of input. Um, but because this is a living document and we can roll with new critical areas, we can roll with new, with new uh, uh, causes and source of impairment as new data comes in. Um, we're working with this right now as, as, uh, as a, uh, a, a way forward, especially with our first ones that came in like the last couple of years. Now we're really looking hard and uh, asking people to get a hold of us right away. We want as many people involved up front as possible. Um, a lot of our projects have already been updated. A lot of these plans have already been updated. But this is key and we're, we continue to uh, do outreach on this and as more people become aware of what's going on and it's not just a document that pays for a pro gets a project uh, uh, eligible. It's more of a really what's wrong with our watershed and let's have a uh, cooper cooperative approach on, on uh, planning to fix it. Chapter two, watershed characterization characterization and assessment, uh, what are the physical and natural features, what are the biological trends, what are the pollution causes and sources of impairment. Obviously we have aquatic life use, we have recreation, we have drinking water, public health has all its designated uses. In Ohio at the 12 digit Huck scale, most of the causes and sources of impairment are purely aquatic life use. We didn't meet our fish metrics, we didn't meet our, our bug metrics, we didn't meet our habitat metrics. Load reductions at the 12, uh, loading issues at the 12 digit Huck scale are largely related to point sources, almost always. Um, and those are handled in the TMDL process. I'll get into something later. Downstream use uh, uh, non attainment, such as uh, uh, Lake Erie, Western Basin of Lake Erie, that has just recently been listed as impaired, obviously, as a load reduction type of thing. Um, but basically, Chapter 2 basically gives you all the information about the watershed that allows you to develop critical areas. Uh, chapter three, this is the, the meat of the entire document. It's where you select critical areas. It's where you select goals and objectives in each critical area. And uh, it's where everything fleshes out for projects. So um, a critical area, uh, obviously this was a, a, always a, a big question for us and now that there's guidance out from US EPA through uh, the, the Tetra Tech report, that's going to help out quite a bit. But it's, uh, uh, we ask that people include a map of your critical area, um, a, a refinement and explanation of why this particular area in the, in the HUC 12 was chosen versus others, and a detailed characterization of what are the biological trends in this, in this critical area and what are the pollution related causes and sources of impairment. So for instance, this is, this is a, a critical area example where the cause of impairment is siltation and habitat. The sources of impairment are channelization and channel erosion and row crop agriculture. So the critical area is the riparian zones on, the, on some named creeks in the watershed. Uh, it would be fine if you had additional information like the gentleman from yesterday showed the, the different red, orange, and yellow bolded or non-bolded lines in those riparian areas to prioritize what the most important areas for restoration might be. So that's one example. We've also had areas where we have three monitoring locations in the watershed. Two are in attainment. The other one's in non-attainment. Might be in the urban area. Boom, you put the urban area as your, as your critical area. Outline of measurement, measurable goals. Um, these are usually, like I said, to attain aquatic life use. So maybe your, aquat your fish metric is at 43 right now. To attain water quality standards, you need to be at 50. So you're, you're in, that, in that wiggle room range. For a load reduction, it would be, you know, here's, what, here's where we need to be in load, here's where we are now. Somewhere in between is what we're trying to accomplish. Um, some of these 12 digit hucks have reservoirs in them and in those cases where the goal is to eliminate or the frequency of nitrate uh, exceedances or the frequency of harmful al algal blooms. So in the template or in the example you'll see in each critical area goals will be listed something like this. Uh, the goal is to achieve an IBI or fish score of 34, it's not, it's a 26 now, et cetera. Um, Quantifiable objectives, this is where we say, okay, now we know what our goals are, what can we do or what should we, what could be reasonably accomplished to uh, meet those goals. 
So for this critical area, we have restore 3,000 feet of severely eroded stream bank, restore 6,400 linear feet of, uh, of stream using natural channel design features, restore floodplain, uh, plant 10 acres of wooded riparian buffer, or you could have done linear feet, or 100 acres of conservation reserve program. Um, in an urban area, this could have been different. This could have been um, install or, or eliminate impervious surfaces by a, a certain amount. Big question we had, uh, everyone always said, well, how, how do we know how many objectives or how much or what quantity of each uh, BMP are necessary to uh, achieve the goals? And uh, we always say, well, eventually, especially if it's a 319 related project, we'll do uh, pre and post monitoring to see how much progress we make we make toward uh, meeting the metrics. Um, but we, at the end of all of our objectives, we always say, I, we advise them to mention that these objectives, both type and quantity, will be re-evaluated re and modified in order to meet goals um, as more information becomes available. So it leaves an, adapt, an adaptable way there. Chapter four is starts out with here's a ta here's a project summary here's here's some ideas that are on the bookshelf right now to uh, achieve uh, our goals. Um, this one's blank right now, but if you look, I got this thing here. Um, this kind of shows uh, what not what's one of the elements are being achieved here. So you're saying who who's involved, um, uh, what who, who's involved what timeline, short, medium, or long priority, what's the estimated cost, and uh, who might fund it are listed by project in the, for each critical area. So here's an example of one that was filled out. This was one, uh, a plan that was taken from a plan developed by a consulting uh, firm. Um, this was a really well-developed plan, uh, but long story short is there's only one short-term project here that's ready to be developed. Um, in this particular one, going back to that, they actually provided a map in the critical area showing where each potential project might be located, and, and uh, a lot of times they'll also tie it in with where our monitoring showed non-attainment. Um, so everything's kind of tied together and, and helps you prioritize those projects. It also gives you an idea of, okay, is this going to be an urban project or is it going to be a stream restoration project, et cetera. Lastly, and this is the most important part, and I'm sorry that you know, I, I tried to figure out a way to show this to you, but project summary sheets go through every nine element criteria. We make sure that everything's covered um, with project narratives, uh, progress toward uh, achieve, achieving milestones and metrics. Um, because uh, US EPA is really involved with load reductions, whether or not it's part of our use attainment problem or not. We always add a load reduction. Um, information and outreach is covered. And then w once this plan is approved, um, we'll have a RFP or a nomination or a pro project come in and we will, uh, there'll be a, an application form where this is fleshed out even more with maps and, and exp explanation. But um, a lot of times I know Paul asked for more information in these and, and I of course we understand why because these are these are, uh, you know, what, what's being used to determine eligibility at the, for the nine element plan. Real quick, I thought, yeah, I got one minute left. Cropland acres, this has been a big deal in Ohio. Um, Lake Erie just got listed as impaired, so we weren't advising people to say, hey, write a nine element plan to fix Lake Erie because it wasn't listed as impaired until just recently. But this was one example where, okay, cropland is the critical area. 85% of the watershed is cropland. Do we really want 85% of the watershed to be the critical area? So we always advise, and you'll notice I blocked this out, and I blocked it out for a reason, but we advise them, okay, you can't have 85% of the watershed be the critical area, so please prioritize uh, those critical areas based on proximity to streams, soil test level, um, whether there's a riparian corridor or not, et cetera. So, but there, there's a, a real good opportunity, and there, you guys have heard about the Ag Conservation Planning Framework in the uh, last few days. It shows where the I ideal locations of practices would be. Um, for, for instance, for runoff control or for field drainage, tile drainage treatment. 
These are actual maps for an uh, anonymous watershed. We do want to work with USDA. We think that they could be a uh, good, good uh, priority type of situations. And, and USDA has historically divided up their equip funds to radiate counties. There's usually enough for one good project, it's usually a structural project, not necessarily focused on a nine element plan. What if you had $200,000 to install a manure, manure system through their program or $200,000 to install 100 control drainage structures in a, in a targeted way? So we got some work to do with our partners there and, and I hope we were able to do that. Um, I'm, I'm almost done, ma'am. So uh, uh, the, the non-point source implementation strategy is about the projects. It's a living planning document. It's a bookshelf of projects from short term to long term. The short-term projects are a list of ready-to-go projects and with summaries that we would expect if an RFP came out that people would be ready to apply for funding in a targeted way. Real quick, here's where we are right now. Ohio has 1,538 Huck 12s. We also have large river Hucks. We also have Lake Erie Hucks. Right now we have 56 approved nine element plans. Those are the green ones. We have 25 equivalent plans uh, that uh, are part of uh, Washington Action Plans uh, approved in Indiana. Um, we're going to be talking with Indiana on how we might be able to work with these border line, border hucks. We have 62 nine, or nine element uh, equivalent uh, acid mine drainage plans and we have 19 in progress. So we're making, making it there, but you'll see the ones that have been developed so far have largely been in the Toledo area for, for Lake Erie issues. They have a, a watershed group there. We also have active watershed groups in the Cleveland area, so a lot of them have been related to that and the funding was, was by their uh, municipalities. Of, of late, we have a regional priority where we know we have higher loading from this particular watershed. We're trying to get plans developed in that, in that region. There's about 100 Huck 12s there. Um, the idea there is let's assign them a, a, a load goal for phosphorus and uh, try to achieve that. And uh, that's gonna take some, uh, it takes some finagling to work with the ag, ag universe there. And that's that same watershed. Almost done, Dynamo plan is a valuable resource. It determines project eligibility. It's a crossover resource for TMDL implementation planning. And yes, if there's a TMDL where there's no point source issues, why not just have uh, the implementation be part of a nine element plan at the HUF 12 level? Um, we're talking about that here in Ohio, um, but it's at the ready eligible projects. There's been times where GLRI has said, hey, do you have, we have money, do you have projects that are ready to go? And we say, yes, they meet the nine elements, they're right here, here they are. Um, but what's, what's wrong, let's fix it, let's get going uh, and update it as necessary. Thank you, my name, number, email, you can get a hold of me or anyone in our office at any time, I'd be happy to talk you through what we've done. Thank you very much. see a lot of my face because I've been on the planning committee. So um, today I'm excited. We're taking, we're in the home stretch here talking about Ag NTS. Um, got three great speakers. We'll be talking about water quality assessment and soil health. Um, just a little aside because I have to have a theme for my things I'm out of. Um, so Nebraska Tourism Commission, I, have no, I don't know if you've heard, but they have a new slogan that they unveiled about a week or two ago and it's really self-deprecating and meant to poke fun at us, but um, it's Nebraska. Honestly, it's not for everyone. Um, and Stephen Colbert really picked up on that and, and had a heyday with it and came up with alternative themes for other states. So I thought I would do that for the three speakers today from Colorado, Kansas, and Iowa. So for Iowa, I thought it would be great to say, Iowa, at least we don't have hurricanes. But yeah, they get hurricane money. Um, Kansas, two less letters than Arkansas, and Colorado, decent seafood can be thrown, can be flown in. So at that, Steve, take it away. He's been with um, Iowa DNR since 2000, and he's the 319 non-point source coordinator. 
Morning, everybody. Well, when I speak to project coordinators in the state of Iowa, I usually thank them for the work that they do being on the front lines of improving water quality in Iowa. And I feel that after hearing all the great talks over the last three days, I need to turn that around and, and thank you folks because you're really at the forefront of improving water qual quality across the country. So thank you. Okay, getting, and that's really the purpose of my talk, which is about improving water quality. Since the primary goal of our 319 program in Iowa is to improve water quality, we feel that the best way to measure that is to actually go out and conduct water monitoring. And since our ambient water monitoring program doesn't provide us enough information, and since counting up BMPs does not prove that water quality is actually improved, we've devoted 319 funding to fund targeted watershed monitoring in the state of Iowa. And so the, this presentation is an overview of some of those water monitoring efforts. These are the basic questions that we ask with our water monitoring. Is the, is the water quality actually improving? Are we targeting the right pollutant? Are we targeting the right areas? Is the water body still impaired? And is the watershed actually the problem? We're currently funding 13 different nine element watershed projects in the state of Iowa. And we're conducting targeted water monitoring for each of those projects. And the main purpose of that is to gauge whether or not water, water quality is improving within those nine element watershed areas. So our first type of water monitoring is what we call 319 monitoring. And this is where we set up the, a water monitoring protocol for each of those nine element watershed projects. And we base it off, we base the monitoring protocol on whether we're testing for WQ10A, and now we're gonna have to change the name to S21, or whether we're um, trying to measure for SP12, and of course that just went away, so we're gonna have to change our monitoring plans. We're also trying to make sure that we're um, testing the pollutant that's linked to the impairment. So for example, if it's a bacterial impairment, we're testing for E. coli. We're testing different stream segments to try to see if there are differences within a watershed. And we're also testing different sub watersheds to, to try to gauge improvement within the, the entire watershed. This is a, an example of one of our watershed projects, the Yellow River Headwaters. Um, this one has a bacterial impairment, and so as I had indicated before, we're testing for E. coli within Yellow River headwaters. And the blue dots in the map show the monitoring locations within the watershed, um, both on the main stem and the north branch of the Yellow River and along several different tributaries. And this gives us an extensive database to, to help us gauge trends in E. coli that we wouldn't otherwise have if we didn't have this water, water monitoring going on or 319 monitoring. And similarly, this is an example of our lake 319 monitoring. This is a map of the Badger Creek Lake watershed. And again, um, given that this particular lake has an algae-based impairment, our primary testing is phosphorus and sediment, uh, we're conducting water monitoring at nine different monitoring sites within the watershed, three sites within the lake, and a few other sites on the tributaries. And again, the main point is that we're trying to find if we're making progress within the watershed. And um, looking at this particular graph, this is a graph of the Yellow River Headwaters, the watershed project that I just mentioned two slides before. Um, this, fortunately, is showing a decline in E. coli levels at three different sites within the watershed. Um, not all of our watershed projects provide water quality improvement trends. This watershed does, unfortunately. And we feel that this data is important because it helps us justify continuing the project if we can see that we're actually making improvements. And if there are sites where we're not making improvements, then it helps give information to our watershed coordinator where additional work needs to be done to address the impairment. So that's our 319 monitoring. Another study that we've been working on is what we call the statewide muscle survey. And um, 
since native mussels are indicators of biological health in Iowa's rivers and streams, um, we felt it was important to do this study. And this one, which we funded with 319 funding, was a seven-year study of mussels to replicate previous studies that had been done in the state of Iowa. And in it, we resampled old sites and then added new sites to the study. And this was a study we did in-house where our aquatic biologist, Jennifer Kurth, led this study. She works in our watershed improvement section. This particular map shows the previous locations of the three previous mussel surveys that had been done in the state of Iowa. They were done in 1984, 1999, and 99 or 2000. And in those previous monitoring um, samples, there were 380 sites that had been sampled. And this, this other map shows us the, shows, shows you the sites that hadn't been monitored through this seven-year study, the statewide mussel survey. And over the seven years, um, Jennifer Kurth, our biologist, studied the 380 old sites, and then in addition, sampled an additional 649 new sites. And in addition to having a lot of fun crawling around in rivers and streams in the state of Iowa, um, Jen was able to compile these results, and you see the results of her study at the bottom of the page. 813 sites were sampled. There were 649 new sites. Over 35,000 mussels were found through the study, and there were 39 different species that were found through the study. And probably more importantly, these are some of the program results from the statewide mussel survey. Because of the, the mussels that were found, there were 12 impairments delisted. There were 11 sites that were uh, impairments that were confirmed. Jen was able to help develop a new mussel, uh, excuse me, mussel biotic index for the state of Iowa. We've had two non-point source success stories written uh, for Buffalo Creek, which had five segments delisted because of improvements in mussel populations. And then this year we, had a, we have a new story for Lime Creek, which also had an improvement in, in mussels. And in addition, Jennifer is also working on a new field guide to Iowa mussels. So it's really providing us new information in Iowa about, about mussels. Another study that we're working on is what we call NWQI monitoring. Iowa has six different watersheds that have received extra EQIP funding through the NWQI program. All of these, by the way, are also 319 watershed project areas. And in one, one of those watersheds, Blackhawk Lake watershed, which is circled on the map, we chose to do intensive monitoring to see if the extra EQIP funds and the extra BMPs that were installed actually improved water quality. So for this NWQI study, we contracted with Iowa State University to conduct monitoring at three different sub-watersheds within the Blackhawk Lake watershed. One had a few, or had some BMPs implemented, and the two other ones that were sampled, were, which were similar in size, however, one had a low number of BMPs implemented, and the other one had a high number of BMPs implemented, so it enabled us to set up a paired watershed study to compare the two to see if there were differences in water quality. So going through um, a few of the sub-watersheds, this is sub-watershed eight. This is one of the three. However, um, this is not one of the two paired watersheds. This one had 22.5% of the area with, with BMPs, so it's considered fairly low with BMP implementation. Sub-watershed 11 is one of our paired sub-watersheds. It's considered our low BMP sub-watershed. And subwatershed 12 is our high BMP subwatershed. So these two subwatersheds are very similar in size, at around 550 acres. And um, the difference, the primary difference, is the simply the, the high BMP implementation in subwatershed 12. So through the, through the monitoring that Iowa State's doing, they're monitoring for these parameters of primary importance to us is phosphorus and sediment. Since Blackhawk Lake has an algae-based impairment, we're trying to make sure that there's, we're trying to gauge improvement and reductions in sediment and phosphorus. 
And these are the conclusions that we have so far from the study. Subwatershed 11, which is the uh, low BMP watershed, is to the left of the screen, and subwatershed 12, which is the high BMP watershed, is on the right. And um, after four years of monitoring, the high BMP subwatershed uh, shows runoff with 36% less nitrate, 39% less total phosphorus, and 95% less soil loss. So we can breathe this sigh of relief that uh, things are actually going the right way. Moving on, um, another paired watershed study that we're doing is an urban paired watershed study. And this is within the Easter Lake watershed, which is within the city of Des Moines. We did the same sort of thing where we set up a treatment subwatershed that has targeted BMPs, and we have a control subwatershed with no BMPs in the watershed at all. And in this particular study that was, is being set up, we're also doing the study in-house. Um, our TMDL biologist, Jason Palmer, has been doing monitoring from these two subwatersheds for the past four years. This map shows the two subwatersheds. The treatment subwatershed is highlighted in yellow at the top of the map. Um, that's the watershed where our project coordinator has been very aggressively promoting urban best management practices in the subwatershed. The low BMP subwatershed is highlighted in red. It's in the lower right-hand corner. And they've not done any outreach to that neighborhood down there, so there are no urban BMPs that have been implemented so far. And kind of looking closely at the treatment subwatershed uh, before the project started, um, that's the, the area on the left, the, and the area on the right, the mid-project um, slide shows that that there have been changes in implementing urban practices because of the work of the project where um, they've been actively in, in, in installing Raiden Gardens, bioretention cells, soil quality restoration, and pervious driveways. So lots of work reaching out to this particular treatment subwatershed to implement practices. And fortunately, the results are positive so far that the treatment subwatershed is, is showing 27% less runoff compared to the, the control subwatershed. And according to Jason Palmer, who's doing this study, um, he feels that we can therefore consider that we're getting approximately 27% less sediment and phosphorus, which is proportional to the reduction in runoff based on this study. So it tells us that what's going on in the watershed project is working. Moving on, the beach sand study is yet an, another major study that we're working on. And again, um, our biologist Jason Palmer is coordinating this particular study. And I, I just had to quote one of our former TMDL staffers who came up with this phrase, it's the geese, stupid. And his comment was about the amount of geese on Big Creek Lake, which is one of our watershed projects. And he, his point was that he felt that the bacteria problem at Big Creek Beach, and which actually applies to other state park beaches in the state of Iowa, was related to too many geese. And when we implemented the 319 project at Big Creek Lake, we implemented a number of goose reduction strategies to try to reduce the number of geese around the lake to help reduce the bacteria loads on the beach. So even though that work has been done, we wanted to make sure that we had science behind it. And so that's when this beach sand study began, and not just because of goose problems at Big Creek, but because of goose problems we have at a lot of state park beaches around the state. Jason Palmer, our biologist, um, has set up a monitoring protocol within the Big Creek uh, beach area where he's got um, transects across the beach sand and through the water. And so the yellow lines there are showing areas where he's conducting E. coli monitoring of sand at different locations of the Big Creek Beach. And th this is an important beach to us because it's the largest state park beach in the state of Iowa. The, the red line shows that where he's doing water monitoring out in the swimming area at different points, to, again, to try to make some comparisons between the sand and the water. And his study design is set up such that the, the blue line is the water line. He's um, trying to make 
he's trying to gather data looking at the near to far shore sand E. coli numbers, the near to far shore water numbers. He's trying to see if there's an association between the sand and the water E. coli concentrations and whether there's a difference between the swim zone and the open lake. Here's Jason um, conducting his sampling. He's collecting uh, sand to, to do his E. coli sampling at the Big Creek Beach. And his results have been showing that the highest E. coli levels are in the sand um, very close to the waterline. And in particular, what's, what's interesting is, is his data is showing um, that, that e. Coli, those E. coli levels are hundreds to thousands of times higher in the sand than they are in the water. So we know that looking at the sand is very important to find out what's going on with the water at the beach. One of the main, and I had mentioned um, right next to the, the beach area, there's a, an excess of water this photo shows that there have been an, an excess of rainfall events and on a beach like this, which, which has low gradient, um, high water levels seem to be associated with E. coli at the beach. The last paired study is related to how our park staff are removing goose poop and other debris from, from beaches, and especially at the, be the Big Creek Beach, which, which is where Jason is doing his study where we're comparing the conventional way that our park manager grooms the beach, and that's where he harrows the beach. That's the harrow on the left and on the right. Um, our DNR Lake Restoration Program bought a $45,000 um, beach groomer, a barber brand beach groomer that actually picks up sand and goose poop and other debris. And we're, Jason is doing a comparison of E. coli between those two areas of the beach to see if there's a difference. And after two, two years of monitoring, um, in 2016, um, the side on the right shows that the, the control um, actually had lower levels, excuse me, that, that's on the left, and there, so our treatment was not improving the E. coli levels. But in 2017, the second year, there was no significant difference. So at this point, we don't, we're not sure if the beach groomer is making a difference between the harrow but we feel this data is very important so that we can help provide information to our DNR park staff to help provide them information on, on how to better improve water quality at state park beaches in Iowa and to improve public health. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. We have yep. 10 minutes for questions. Okay. Thank you, Steve, great presentation. And my question is that you mentioned that 319 funding is used to back some of these projects. And I'm just curious if you deal with your um, quality assurance objectives through programmatic QAPs or you have to do site-specific project QAPs based on the nature of the work that you're conducting. Project-specific and we work through our DNR water monitoring section who we work very closely with to develop those. That's an interesting study. Um, have you considered goose behavior in that, that intertidal literal zone? And the, uh, one thing you might want to look at is that there's often regrowth in such areas. So you may not get, be getting um, auto degradation and sterilization in that area. We talk about goose behavior all the time. So yes, we have considered it. And some of the things that they've implemented at the Big Creek Beach, they've planted tall grasses along the side of the beach to help create a, an area that geese cannot see from the water past the beach. Um, they put up goose silhouettes. We've put up, we've hired a dog service over the past five years where we have a guy and a dog that show up at random times to scare away the, beach, the, the geese on the beach. Our park manager has been trying to create more goose habitat in other areas away from the beach. Um, so there have been a series of things that have been implemented. One of the important things we hear from our park manager is that people who go to the beach, particularly parents, want to be able to look down at the water level to see their children. And so although we would love to plant some sort of visual barrier for, for geese, that's not what the people want. And so we're, we're trying to forge a compromise behind what people want and, and addressing goose behavior. But really good question. The 
answer is it depends upon the study. The 319 monitoring is being collected by largely by project coordinators because they're locally, they're right there, so they're on, on site. For the other data, um, the, the one study was conducted by Iowa State and the other two are in-house data. Um, I think those could be used to um, inform the integrated report. I don't know that all that data has been transferred yet. So I think in time it, it could be and will be, yes. Hi, for the uh, urban paired watershed study, what factors went into determining the, the size of the watersheds that you used? I think it was as simple as Jason, our biologist, and our, the project coordinator for the watershed looking at a map and drawing a circle around two areas that were about the same size. And our project coordinator had already begun working very closely with the, the high BMP neighborhood. And because of that, it became our de facto treatment subwatershed. And on the other side of the lake, they just hadn't begun any, treat, any outreach yet. And so we came up with the idea of a paired watershed study and we just, didn't tell the other side of the lake that they weren't being reached out to. So now the secret's out. Hey Steve, have you done any paired watershed studies where you're not seeing a compelling result of BMPs and reduction in runoff for pollutant loadings? And if so, what types of BMPs are not resulting in any improvement? We don't have any other paired watershed studies that we've been doing that I can think of. I'm not sure if Alan can think of any. So that, what I presented is what we've been doing. There are other paired watershed studies out there conducted by others. I, I guess I'm not, I, I'm not sure if those studies are showing as clear a trend as our studies are. Um, so I can't answer that question. I can certainly go back and look around, but yeah, I, I, I can't think of an answer to that question. So it, it's really true though that not every watershed paired study, study is going to show that water quality is improving. And that's the whole reason why we're doing these studies. All right, that about ends our time for Q&A. So let's give Steve a round of applause. Next up is Darren, um, sorry, Darren Harmo, Director of USDA ARS Center for Ag Resources in Fort Collins, where you oversee ARS research. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's, it's cool for me to be in a session that talks about monitoring, because as I'm going to tell you, I've spent the last 20 years doing water quality monitoring, and I'm also very passionate about soil health. It sounds like the last speaker's on soil health, and I think that's one of our keys to really the objectives we're all working forward to. I'm going to try to have an interactive talk. It's, it's difficult in a room like this, but, but I really would like you to ask the question if, if, when I show a slide if you've got a question on it. And I um, want to start off talking about a, a project that we did at Morris Williams Golf Course in Austin, Texas. And I remember that project very well for, for several reasons. Um, the main one is I got hit by a golf ball. Um, I think it was about the second week um, into my tenure with USDA, and most of you are state or government workers, and so can you imagine the paperwork I had to fill out <laughs> to have a workers' comp claim, and then I had to put source of injury golf ball and location of injury golf course, and, and so by the second week uh, in Temple, Texas, I was uh, worried I would get fired, um, but it, it all worked out okay because we were doing legitimate research on uh, turf grass. so. So it was okay. All right, so, so I would like a show of hands, and, and I've categorized these people, but, but are most of you managers that are overseeing monitoring projects or deciding whether monitoring projects are initiated? Could I see your hands? So are there folks that are actually the ones out there going out on a day-to-day -day basis and checking samplers and inspecting sites? Is there some of those? Okay, good deal. Well, for the, um, for the managers, I think I'll be a success today if I talk you out of doing water quality monitoring. Um, it's such a difficult task that if you don't want to do it after I talk to you, there's no way you had the gumption to, to survive the project anyway. Um, and for the technical staff, I hope I um, give you an appreciation of, of the science we've developed to, to help you in your daily routine. 
And then um, probably at the end, um, kind of see how this goes, because I usually give workshops on this topic that are a half a day or so, or maybe a day, and so I'm really trying to think about a way to boil this down into nuggets that, that you guys appreciate. So we might talk into some balancing as well. So, so as I'm standing on the, the edge of a stream at Morris Williams Golf Course in Austin, Texas, I've got an ISCO manual and an ISCO sampler, and my job is to monitor the water quality coming off that golf course. And so I look online. Um, are you guys familiar with these two publications and, and publications like it? Have you all seen, seen those general guidance documents? How much help do those provide if you're standing there actually doing sampling? I mean, I'm, I'm hearing laughing, so I'm thinking you thought the same thing I thought was, well, it's really nice of them to show me a picture of an auto sampler. Um, and this is a picture of a, a flume. Um, but it, it really doesn't tell me how to operate that sampler to get good water quality data. Um, and so, as I'll talk about, I spent from then in the early 2000s up till now trying to, to provide really practical guidance for folks that are doing this type of monitoring. Um, I keep putting small watershed up. It's um, do a lot of edge of field work, so, so runoff from the edge of a farmer field, from a golf course. But it also, the principles apply, I would say, up to kind of the EPA weightable streams level. Um, at some point, the scale's big enough where you need a state agency um, or more often USDS to, to sample because it's just too dangerous. But looking back, now that you know, I've got some hindsight, isn't it true that, that most people that jump into projects underestimate the cost and the difficulty? I mean, that's almost universally true from what I've found out. And I think we're also all frustrated um, because we all have to f be forced to learn from trial and error that we have inconsistent methods. We, we try one method, it doesn't work well, so we switch gears. Um, we make mistakes, so there's missing data values in there. Um, and then we usually get frustrated, and by the end of the, the three or five year project, um, we're so frustrated we might not want to do another project or we don't get fortunate enough to get funding for those projects to take it to the next round. So again, I, the expertise that I've built, not from anything, but really the school of hard knocks is related to small watersheds, um, dealing with sediment, nutrients, and bacteria. So I really don't have any expertise on sampling for pesticides, for instance, or heavy metals. Um, so are most of y'all dealing with more nutrients and bacteria, is that really the common issue that, that most of you face? So I hope it's relevant to what you're doing. I'll show you in a little while um, a website, and it's, it's horribly long. Uh, well, actually, I think I'll go there right now. Um, I want to give you my contact information because I've helped, and it really is countless projects to be set up to do this type of monitoring. And again, you don't want to write down that, that government uh, website address, but the, the presentation is online, and so you can click on it. But that website lists all the publications I have, and they're not, they're not sexy science. It's not a bunch of equations. It's very practical. If I'm standing beside the edge of the stream and I want to s sample for nitrogen, what should I think about? So, so I really think it's, it's a lot of people have used it. Um, and I'd be happy to help you with those projects. So that's why I gave you my cell phone number and my email, um, because I think in an hour or so with you, I can probably get you to six months or a year's worth of knowledge that I learned just from making mistakes. So please, I'm sincere when I say please contact me if I can help with any type of monitoring projects you have. It'd be my pleasure. So I show this picture for, to make a couple points. Um, I was fortunate enough to work at the USDA ARS Riesel Watersheds. It's one of the three original uh, USDA watersheds that were established in, in 1937. Um, the other one was in Coshocton, Ohio, in, in Hastings, Nebraska. And so I, I put the picture on the, um, you guys upper left, to say that I don't think any of you have enough staff to get out there and monitor without automated sampling equipment. We literally had folks on staff from 1937 to manually collect water samples from every single runoff event. So it was to see those historical records in the on-call sheet for that time is actually it was just amazing how organized they were to get up and physically collect samples. 
Um, the picture on the upper right is called a Chickasha sampler. It was the first generation of automated samplers. And have anybody, or did you just, was the first introduction most of you had was more with the ESCOs probably, right? So a USDA location in southern Oklahoma developed an um, automatic sampler, if you will. Um, and, it, and I love, because we've got several of those on site in Riesel, and those are old dairy uh, milk bottles. And so they've got the old three-digit phone number on there. And for Waco, Texas, has the whole phone number is three digits. It's pretty cool on the, the bottles. And then we moved to the, just the regular ISCOs in the 2000s and then moved on to the refrigerated ISCOs um, about 2013, I believe. And I also put 1937 up there because think about the data management involved in a, a sampling project that long, that's that long. But as you talked about, as we all talk about, just managing data is a significant portion of monitoring, so you can't forget to involve IT folks and think about how you're going to maintain and present data as well. So with that, um, I want to ask a basic question, and to, but it's also fundamental. Why do I keep talking about stormwater sampling and dealing with non-point source? Because it's, excuse me, and you can yell something out if you want. Um, it's because on these small watersheds, right, that, that's when it's running off. So it, it's not a, a routine sampling where you're going to a big river, you know, the first week of the month every week and taking a sample. So the, the storm sampling is an emphasis on these small watersheds. And just because of staff limitations, I don't know of an agency maybe besides USGS that actually can get out and actually manually take water samples. Um, I list a lot of the difficulties up there. Um, I want to talk more about QA, QC later, but these products are, are very, very difficult. Uh, most of us want to work on an eight to five Monday through Friday schedule, correct? Well, how many storm events happen eight to five Monday through Friday? I still haven't done an analysis of that, but it would be really interesting to see how many occur on weekends and holidays because it's higher than just by chance. It, it's got to be. Um, can you tell what's clogging up that flume right there, that H flume? It's actually corn cobs. So this, that, that flume was designed well to handle all the flow. Um, it wasn't designed to handle and flush out all the corn cobs that washed off that field and, and, and choked it up. So, so no matter what you do proactively to maintain a site, to have the right equipment, to design it correctly, um, problems will occur on this kind of sampling. Okay, so I said if you, if you do things right, there's still problems going to occur, but can you see problems or any mistakes that were made on this, this sampling site? It was an oil and gas operation in north of Dallas, Texas that we helped. Well, one problem is the, the, on, the, on the left there, that is not designed to, um, for a high sediment load site. You can see the sediment clogged it up. So. Um, but those were educated engineers that designed that, and I didn't realize the sediment load would be that high either. So even with so-called experts, these things are tough because unforeseen events happen. And on the right, um, I wouldn't say that was a mistake made. They, with available resources, you might design a flume or a weir to hold a 25-year storm, and every once in a while there's going to be a 50-year storm or a 100-year storm come through. So um, that creates some interesting problems. This, this slide makes me sad every time I show it because we spent a lot of money on dirt work on, on really making this entrance to this edge of field site really nice. We seeded it, mulched it, and then that very night we got eight inches of rain and washed off not only all our mulch and our seed, but all the dirt we moved and, and had to start over. Um, and then other issues like lightning. I've had two, sits, two sites hit in 20 years with lightning. Um, and so there's, there's budget issues. You, you almost have to budget for some equipment maintenance or equipment uh, replacement as well. And, and most people that design sampling forget about kind of the disaster scenario, but they happen quite often, really. And I show this slide to, to again, emphasize that, that these projects are tough. I'm not going to go into the 20 or 30 slides that I have next that I would give if this was a, a workshop for the field um, because there's so many different ways you can decide to measure flow or not, to take samples, 
to do it. Maybe you think you can save money and do it by not buying automatic equipment. Um, enable level is how high does the water have to get before you start sampling. Should I sample every five minutes during a storm or every 500 cubic feet of flow? Should I put all the samples in one bottle or several bottles or do I need discrete samples in each bottle? All of those components, and that's what you program in an ISCO or another sampler, determine the quality of the data that you get out of those. And really, with all the constraints, financial, personnel, that's quite a, a balancing act. And most people that do these projects don't have really any idea of the technical components, their impact on water quality, um, to try to have a successful project. So again, please contact me if you think I could be of any assistance. I'd be happy to chat with you about it. Is there any general questions about, well, maybe I'll wait because it is such a large room. And I want to slip on and, and talk about uncertainty. And I know that topic gets you extremely excited, right? I mean, you just Most of you are dying to, to see the 20 pages of equations I'm about to present on uncertainty and talk about statistics. Well, so, so I'm not really going to put any um, equations up there. But I would ask you to remember back to freshman chemistry. What are we taught in freshman chemistry about every measurement? If somebody wants to yell it out, it would be great. Yep, so everyone's subject to error. So every measurement we take, we introduce uncertainty into that measurement. And the, the uncertainty of a volumetric flask is obviously less than an Erlenmeyer flask, right? So remember those basics. How many scientific studies, how many databases in Iowa, how many databases in EPA have a data value and the column next to it have an uncertainty value? Like probably this many? I mean, I've seen a few, and there, but we learn in freshman chemistry that every measurement we take has uncertainty, and, and really as a scientific community, we've ignored that fact. And so I want to talk just a little bit about uncertainty and maybe give you an appreciation for, for why it's important. And actually, I really like doing smaller groups where people can yell out answers, but I think I better go on with this. But, so in, in taking a daily nitrate nitrogen load from a small stream. Those are all the categories of not only mistakes, some of them are mistakes, but mostly proper techniques that introduce uncertainty into the, that value. Right, so if you're gonna measure a load versus a concentration, do you have to measure flow? Just to see if we're on the same page. Right, because a, a load is a concentration times a flow volume, so there's uncertainty in just taking that flow measurement. How you collect that sample certainly introduces uncertainty. If you take it in the thalweg, the, the middle, um, deepest part of the flowing stream versus the, the bank, if you take several subsamples across the cross section, um, all those matter. What do we focus, though, on QAPP documents most all the time on these categories? Do we talk about flow measurement much? I don't see much emphasis. We talk a heck of a lot about these two categories, don't we? And why is that, do you think? Why do we focus on the, the chemistry and the, the preservation? My argument is until recently in some of the work we've done and others that we didn't have any idea of the uncertainty. And so we just focus on what we were educated about and we have a lot of knowledge and education on on, on that component. How much uncertainty is enter, entered into the, the final data by just handling the data? I mean, have you seen data sets that have missing values or you see a value and you just know it's wrong? I mean, it just, it just looks wrong, but you have no idea and there's no notation. And so that's also a huge source of uncertainty as well, it can be that, that data management. Carla, how am I doing time-wise? Because I'm cool. Okay. Okay. So I, I may walk around a little bit, and this is a very complicated graph, um, but I think if we take some time on it, um, so knowing that uh, that uncertainty is underappreciated, and I would say 99% not reported, although I am seeing studies now that at least have some 
um, estimate of a certainty. And I submitted to a paper to a journal the other day, and it's actually a requirement for all data that's submitted in a journal to have the uncertainty estimate with it. So that's pretty cool. Um, are you familiar with these box and whisker graphs, most of you? I think if you're not, if you just focus on the dotted line, that's the average. And so what I've shown is Q, or flow measurement, the average uncertainty is plus or minus about 14%. Now, does that strike you as high or low, or, or does anybody have any thoughts on that? And I'm talking about with, this is with proper techniques. So to me, I was a little surprised that something we know a lot about, USGS and USDA have done a ton of work on, on flow monitoring. And really the best we can expect is that 10 to 15% uncertainty on flow measurement. Okay, so I've divided up, and if we're just looking at sediment, so just soil erosion, we can introduce uncertainty by collection. C stands for collection, preservation, and storage, and analysis. And so what's the most important thing when you're collecting a runoff sample to determine erosion? What, where is your uncertainty introduced? It's, it's in that collection. And does that make sense logically? Because sediment's not distributed throughout that that runoff water, right? It's heavy and so it tends to, to settle towards the bottom. Preservation and storage, it's insignificant because sediment doesn't change. We're just looking at a mass, I mean a mass, and then analysis is very simple. So if you're, if you really want to improve your sediment sampling, you don't focus on these traditional QA aspects, you focus on collecting a good sediment sample that's representative of the runoff. Does that make sense? If you're looking at dissolved nutrients, why is the collection uncertainty less than for sediment, for instance? Cool. Yeah, it's dissolved, so most likely it's distributed fairly homogeneously throughout the water column, and so it's easier to take a representative sample. The preservation and storage and analysis um, uncertainty is higher because those are more complicated techniques. We have a little um, post-collection degradation that can occur. If you're looking at total nutrients, which is the combined, the, the particulate attached and the dissolved, you see the influence of the, the sediment collection kicking in here, um, and then differing techniques for preservation and analysis. Look at most of the, the data processing and management uncertainty. It's really low most of the time, right? Because we generally don't transpose a six and a nine or, a, or write an extra zero or have a sample being contaminated that we don't know about, but when it occurs on those rare occasions, that's a huge percent uncertainty because that value is just, we just don't know it. So what you're probably more interested in than all these categories is the final numbers. Have you guys ever seen uncertainty estimates for flow, sediment, nitrogen, phosphorus, or bacteria? So. Has anybody ever seen this? Oh man, really good work this Harmel guy did and published it. It's, it, it really is the only data out there that shows it. Um, and I can get you those publications or, as well. But just for reference, remember we were talking kind of down in that 10 to 12%, just I would focus on the dots here because um, they're the means. Sediment more like 15 to 20, dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus in that plus or minus 20%. You get up to the total and you're maybe plus or minus 30. And look at bacteria, much, much higher, which that makes sense to everybody, right? A lot of talk about uncertainty in bacteria. And so we published an uncertainty estimate for bacteria data. And the reason I drew that, that dotted line is with very careful site selection and concerted QAPP, we can get bacteria plus or minus, down to plus or minus 40%, I think is about the best we can really do. I'm gonna finish with one more slide. And tell you that, or ask you to consider really, I don't, I don't mean to tell you, um, can you think about the value that having that uncertainty column next to your data column brings to you if you're a regulator or decision maker? And you know that that data in that column is plus or minus 10% versus plus or minus 
And, and again, I think for all the reasons that I've, I've just touched on that, that we really need to hold ourselves as scientists and the regulatory community needs to hold us as scientists from the outside to a higher standard because freshman chemistry taught us something that we're ignoring over the years. With that, I'll go back to my contact information. I've, I know I've touched on a lot of subjects. I hope I've made you think about them and um, on the uncertainty, and, and I really would be happy to talk to you about your monitoring, and um, I think I can keep you from making those same mistakes that I made and uh, hopefully save a little time and money for you. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Great, thank you. We've got eight minutes or so for questions. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Just, I wanted to offer a little bit more information um, in regards to your work, the monitoring guidebook that EPA has on on point source monitoring. We just updated it in 2016. Cool. And your study, including the uncertainty study, are referenced in there. Oh. So I think it's good to know and it's important to know who's aware of it, and we're mm. actively working on how to get this information more accessible to people. So I oh. look forward to following up with you. Oh, Thanks. yeah, cool. I didn't know it was in there. So that's USGS was working on a, how to use auto samplers, um, but then the scientist that was deleting that effort retired, and I haven't seen them move on that. So it's, it's cool. So if I can help, let me know. Uh, Darren, uh, one comment and, then, and one question, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. On the equipment loss, I, you know, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up because we've had several cases where we've had equipment loss because of storms. You know, we thought we had the ISCO well out of the, uh, the right. reach of a storm, and, right. and, and that proved to be wrong. Um, I don't know if other states have this as well, but I know in Iowa, since we're essentially a self-insured entity, we have a mechanism in our state where we can put in a claim uh, with the state itself and you know, explain what happened, why it happened, what the cause was, the extremity of the loss, and, and they will actually compensate us back so mm. we can recover the, the value of that equipment and then re, you know, repurchase equipment, right. hopefully place it a little more strategically the next time so we don't have to keep having the same problem. So that's something, if, if you haven't uh, explored that in your state and you do have equipment losses, you, you may have a mechanism within your state to allow you to recover that, that cost. Mm. Um, so that's, that's one good news, at least in Iowa. The, the other, and your uncertainty issues, especially with the with sediment, I, I found really intriguing because I've had this discussion and uh, sometimes debate internally before because I've been around a long time. My first job out of college was uh, setting up an in-stream sediment monitoring network for the state of Illinois, mm. and uh, we immersed ourselves in USGS protocols, depth integrated sampling and things like that, recognizing you know, the complexity of the sediment moving in a, in a fluvial stream system and particle sizes has a lot to do with right. whether or not you're going to capture and you know, we, we've, we've gotten, in my opinion, lazy with sediment because we just do grab samples at the surface. And depending on what kind of sediments you have in that system, you may or may not be capturing um, all of the sediments that are moving in that system. And, and that just increases the uncertainty. I realize that depth integrated sampling is complex and expensive and very manpower centric and very time consuming. But what are your thoughts on, on that shift that we've made over the last 30 or 40 years, I guess, in my case? Um, from following those very well-tested USGS protocols for sediment sampling to what we do nowadays. Yeah. My initial reaction is, in society, we do so much of that, right? We're, we're taught a basic truth and we're given information and then as, as time and technology go on, we, we cut corners and um, we get mad at the farmers for doing that, right? But, but we do it because it's easier to stick an automatic sampler out there. So. Um, really, if you're sampling at a scale above the scale I'm talking about, USGS is your go-to agency. That they have the expertise and they're going to hold because their their regulation is so strict on their their QA that they're going to hold you to that. Um, there's ways to cut corners um, that we could talk about later. You can take a do the sampling you're talking about intensively, put a, a single intake sampler, and then develop a relationship between this two to kind of see what ratio you're collecting. Um, I say we do that in so many ways. And again, that's a topic we could talk about for two hours, really. You know, and it's, it's, so I don't mean to cut you short. It's, I don't know where to stop the conversation because it's, yeah. Well, I have a question. 
In New Mexico, we deal with a lot of stream temperature impairments and collect a lot of temperature data. And one issue we run into when we're analyzing it is uh, autocorrelation based on the daily values. And I'm wondering if you've done work on that or run into that with your other parameters that you're looking at. That's an area, like I said, metals earlier, pesticides, where I haven't done more like a continuous sampling and dealt with, dealt with those issues, so I really don't have much expertise on that. And I do, while you, where you, I do have several hard copies. I don't keep copies anymore, but I w there is a few of this, this general guidance. If anybody wants it, I'd be happy to sit at the back or something. Or, yep. Oh. Darren, I just wondered if you might be able to speak. I mean, just coming from a place of practicality in this, uh, if you had to tell one that's new to this, what method they should represent uncertainty for routine nutrient sediment oh. bacteria sampling, what would be your immediate response to that? I mean, as mm. far as like, because there's many different ways you could represent it. Yeah. My simple mind works well with plus or minus percent. So that's the way I like to do it. A more statistically minded want to use, you know, plus or minus a standard deviation or something, but I like plus or minus percent. So you're talking mathematically, right? Okay. And I would say that instead of putting no estimate of uncertainty, we've done enough work and it's published and, and highly referenced. If you go in there, it'll give you some general estimates and at least that general information based on your sites and your techniques to correlate with the data you present would be better than having nothing. So, so we do present some general estimates for all those parameters. We have time for one last question, if anybody has one. And if not, let's give a round of applause. Thank you. By the way, I was sampling um, for a few years at the University of Nebraska, and I, I totally agree. Those storms only happened on weekends. But um, so next up, um, Andy reminded me that we are saving the best for last. <laughs> and. Um, Andy comes from Kansas. He's with KDHE, where he's the program manager for the RAP technical unit. And he'll be talking about soil health, which I think a lot of us are interested in. Every day we're learning more about our living and life-giving soil and how dependent we are upon it. In the past, Little thought was given to the vast kingdom of microbes below ground. However, we now realize without healthy life below ground, there'd be little life above it. Not so long ago, it was thought that the best hope for our soil was to slow its loss by using conservation practices to reduce wind and water erosion. But farmers and scientists have discovered that we can actually build better functioning, higher performing, and more productive soils. In fact, healthy soils rich in organic matter and microbial life may well be the key to feeding the world's growing population sustainably well into the future. And by farming in ways that protect and enhance soil microbes and improve soil health, farmers and ranchers are breathing new life into our soil. This video series will show you how they're doing it and what that means for all of us. Thank you. Well, I wanted to show that video to start off a little bit here this morning because I wanted everybody to have a visual idea of what we're talking about when we, when we talk about improving soil health. But one of the things that, uh, you know, I really wanted to emphasize from that video was when they talked about the fact that we're actually learning that what we've been doing for a long, long time, uh, it's probably not exactly right, that we can actually do better. And that, um, you know, some work that's come out, and, and Greg touched on it on Tuesday, um, a, a new tool that's out from ARS, the yeah, Agricultural Conservation Planning Framework Tool. I um, had a conceptual model with it that I really think is great and to me tells the tale um, about how we've, 
we've maybe had the model a little wrong about how we've approached agricultural conservation over time and how we can do better in the future. Um, you know, what I appreciate so much about the pyramid is that it really does focus on the foundation of soil health and that by improving soil health on every acre out there, that we are then able to implement conservation systems up the line and that those conservation systems when in place are actually the best way to improve water quality. So Lisa did a great job on Tuesday as well, kind of going over soil health principles, what those are, and, and I want to touch on them just a little bit here as well. You'll have arguments with people over there, whether there's four principles of soil health or five principles of soil health, but really we're all talking about the same thing here. Those principles really are that we need to reduce the disturbance to these soil ecosystems, and what we mean by that is we need to stop with so much tillage. We also need to armor that soil surface with crop residue and with, with cover crops and companion crops. And we want, the idea there is we want to have a living plant root in the ground as much of the year as possible. We also need to really manage and reduce some of our synthetic chemical inputs, fertilizer, herbicide, insecticide. These, these inputs dramatically affect the ecology in the soil. There's actually a, a feedback loop associated there that we'll talk about in a little more detail. And finally, we need to get livestock back out on these cropland uh, areas. And by integrating rotational or managed types of grazing, we can actually improve soil health um, while being able to do some, some really uh, nice things for profitability. So, I mean, that sounds great. I hope everybody's kind of excited about what you're hearing so far, but I, I hope you're kind of asking the question, um, you know, it's great, but, you know, why are we so concerned about that with water quality? Why have we heard so much about it um, at this conference? And the answer is, is that because improving soil health improves water quality, and it actually does that in a whole bunch of different ways. And so, you know, the main takeaway from my, my presentation today is to really step through the different principles and the different ways that I think we can gain load reduction and improve water quality when we're able to implement soil health principles. So when we're able to to stop some of that tillage and we're able to reduce erosion and, and we're able to do that pretty dramatically. We can, we've had plot level data in Kansas to show that uh, you know, these systems can get down as low as half a ton an acre per year erosion, which is, is pretty neat. We know the cover crops uptake and, and cycle nutrients in the field, which is, is really important um, from an ecological standpoint, but there's also a whole technology uh, aspect to this nutrient management that comes into play that actually improves soil health as well. So we'll touch on that a little bit. When we're able to increase the organic matter in our soils and, and increase the carbon levels, we can actually decrease the total volume of runoff. And we'll talk about some of the impacts that that has. And then finally, we'll talk about how getting livestock back out on those cropland uh, systems can actually improve the soil health of, of the cropland, but it also can improve uh, soil health for our pasture and rangeland, our perennial grassland system. So let's start stepping through them and, and try to drill down a little bit into the, you know, the mechanisms in which soil health actually improves water quality. So when we, we look at erosion and we think about how erosion actually occurs, we know that uh, a, a few different things are going on. Um, you know, one of the first things that has to happen is that soil particles have to detach from the larger soil aggregate. And one of the main ways that that happens is when a, a raindrop will impact the bare soil surface. There's a tremendous amount of energy that, is, that the raindrop hits that soil with, and you get a splash effect. And that splash effect, again, detaches those soil particles from the soil aggregate. And, and once those, those particles are are free, once they aren't connected to a larger aggregate, they are much more easily eroded, they are much more easily carried off of the edge of the field. When we're able to have uh, crop residue on the field, and especially when we have a living plant, to capture the energy, when that raindrop hits a living plant, much of the energy is dissipated. That drop of water is then able to, to much more uh, slowly come down and, and interface with the soil surface and infiltrate 
into the soil and actually be stored in the soil. We also know that there's a, a tremendous amount of erosion that occurs uh, from ephemeral gully erosion. And, and that can be up to as much as 40% of the total amount of erosion measured at the field edge can be from uh, ephemeral gully erosion. And, and so I show a few pictures here to show how some of these different systems uh, can, can dramatically affect the amount of sediment that's transported off the edge of the field. Um, and, and really the mechanism for which that happens is, is surface roughness that you have with, with crop residue and with cover crops. This is actually a living crop. So, uh, you know, this is a, 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 a rye or triticale cover crop. Um, it's during the winter. It's, um, you know, it's uh, not actively growing at the moment, but those roots actually are alive in that plant. And so you, the, the fact that you have a living plant root in the ground that anchors down that soil as well um, is very important. It's not all about what's happening above ground. It's very much what's happening below ground. And you can see the consequences when you do not have um, that type of cover and you, those plant roots in the ground. So we know that, uh, that cover crops uptake and cycle nutrients in the field, but, but what are we really talking about there? Well, there's a number of different mechanisms, I think, that, that cover crops in particular uh, impact uh, nutrients. And, and some of those are uh, you know, that we can reduce the amount of, of nutrients that leach below the root zone for those cash crops. We just talked about how we can reduce erosion, and we know that uh, we can also decrease um, the, the amount of soluble nutrients uh, that, that are able to, to go in that runoff simply by being uptaken by those uh, living plants. We can reduce uh, a lot of denitrification and losing that nitrogen in the gaseous form. Now, it's a little um, counterintuitive, if you will. We talk about wanting denitrification to happen maybe once uh, you get off of the edge of that field. But actually, in field, we do not want that nitrogen to leave the soil. We want that soil to be there, um, to be sampled so that the producer can use that nitrogen to grow his next cash crop. Uh, one of the things that a lot of producers are interested in is, is trying to use deep-rooted cover crops to actually bring nutrients up from below the root zone of our common cash crops and then make those available to subsequent cash crops. One of the great things that uh, you know, we can do if, if we get the timing right is that we can introduce a lot of legumes to the system. And, and these legumes are, are plants that can fix atmospheric nitrogen through a symbiotic relationship with bacteria that live on their root systems. And we can actually uh, build quite a bit of nitrogen in the soil um, through the use of legumes. Now, the, the research on nutrient loading with soil health uh, is a bit uh, difficult to, to quantify. Um, one of the things that I really lean on heavily is some of the, kind of the Midwestern states uh, have done a lot of good work with their state's nutrient reduction strategies. And when you look at some of the summaries of, of those states, um, they, they are looking in the ballpark of about a 30% total phosphorus reduction um, from systems, no-till, cover crop systems that properly manage nutrients. So when you know, we look at all that, and, and, and I'll show the diagram. I hope you've been looking at it a little bit. Um, one of the reasons I like the diagram is that it really shows the timing aspect, and, and getting that timing down is very important for producers and the decisions that they make on nutrient application. You have to know when those nutrients are going to be available, and we have to know when the plant's going to need them to be available. So understanding the timing is, is, is very important. So when we look at, at you know, nutrient management as it pertains to, to cover crops in particular, um, I really like to think of this as more of a, an ecological type of nutrient management, which is very, very important. But it doesn't tell um, the entire tale. Um, we actually need to to utilize technology as well, and, and there's, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of work done in, in the past handful of years, and um, it's really exciting. And the way that we can manage nutrients, we can utilize nutrients um, more efficiently um, to both improve production, but at the same time improve water quality. And some of the ways that we do that are that we create uh, soil management zones within our fields, and we, we do that by collecting data. This is very much a data-driven process. Some of the, the key data sets that are needed to create these soil management zones are grid or zone soil sampling. Uh, of course, we take the soil series mapping. That's important. 
Um, one of the most important things is to use yield monitor data. I was talking to a, a gentleman who owns a, a soil sampling company in the state of Kansas, and the statistic he told me was that only 9% of all of the yield monitor data in the United States it's, that comes from your combine is ever downloaded and actually used to make further management decisions. Now, farmers love yield monitors, all right? They will look at that yield monitor all the time as they're driving the combine through the field. And they inherently know the spots in their fields where they are going to see more yield and where they're going to see less. So if you ever get a chance to ride in a combine with a producer, you know, you, you got to watch, make sure you don't get a sore neck because you will be looking up at that yield monitor routinely with that producer. That's, that's how it works. But the problem is, is we're not using that data in our decision-making processes about how much uh, fertilizer to use out in the field. So when we can collect all that data, we can, we can analyze that data, we can come up with a prescription that allows us to use variable rate technology and only apply the right amount of nutrients that we need to those particular spots in the field where the crop can utilize those nutrients. Uh, you know, I think it was talked about maybe in, in some questions on Tuesday about, you know, farmers seeing that some, some additional uh, fertilizer out there is almost an insurance policy. Well, you know, that, that's, that's one way to look at it, but, you know, that insurance policy costs money. And, and producers, when you can use data to help take uncertainty out of the equation for them, um, then, then they're much more willing to, uh, to apply the amount of nutrients that they can utilize and, and therefore improve water quality by not having those nutrients available to run off. So, you know, the, the, the variable rate nutrient technology is, is coming on rapidly. There is heavy investment from, uh, you know, the agricultural industry. Um, you know, we can't hardly find a co-op in Kansas anymore that doesn't have at least one variable rate rig. Um, and again, that's all, that's all a cloud-based uh, process. It, there's not a lot of, of um, uh, user error. This is information. These, these equations are being done um, you know, with programs that have been written for that. This information is downloaded directly to the spray rig, the dry fertilizer rig. And so um, we're able to see some, some really neat results from that. So one of the things I wanted to touch on here was you know, when we're talking about precision nutrient management uh, and, and the, the gains that we're seeing is that, you know, the agricultural industry understands uh, that this is a problem. And, and specifically, the, the fertilizer industry has tried to, uh, to get their act together a little bit. And, and the way that they've gone about that is uh, through their 4R nutrient stewardship uh, program. And, and for those of you who are not familiar with the 4Rs, what what this does is, is for agronomists and crop consultants to talk to producers about, you know, trying to get four things right with your, your fertilizer um, applications, and that's to make sure you have the, the right source at the right rate, you're applying it at the right time, and you're doing that in the right place. Um, I won't lie to you. I don't love everything about the 4R Nutrient Stewardship Program, but I do believe that this is a huge step forward in, in you know, where we're at in, uh, in working with the agricultural industry to try and address some of these water quality problems. Uh, we had a, a, a RAPS annual meeting in Kansas last year um, where we had all of our watershed coordinators, and we actually had a co-op manager come and give a presentation um, about nutrient management, and uh, he gave a good presentation. But the most interesting thing was, was after the presentation was over and in talking with him, he said, you know, uh, co-op manager would not have stood up in front of a water quality meeting five years ago and given a presentation. That just wouldn't have happened. So we might be making a little progress. And, and I think he's right. You know, I, I think it's, it's crazy to think that we're ever going to truly address nutrient loading unless we talk to and work with the people that actually go out and put nutrients on the field. Okay? So I do think there's some, some good work that's being done there. And of course, we all know uh, you know, the, the effects um, of nutrient loading. And, and the one that, you know, is really hitting us hard in Kansas right now is, is harmful algal blooms. Um, and, it, you know, it's becoming a real issue. And, and um, you know, when we talk about water quality and, 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 and trying to improve water quality and get delistings, um, you know, the, the immediate need to see that happen is generally not there for a lot of the general public. 
when you have a harmful algal bloom, when it shuts down a public water supply, as it did in the state of Kansas this year, we actually had to call in the National Guard to bring water to a city of about you know, 1,500 people. That's a big deal. That has an impact on people's lives, and, and that gets people's attention. So we also know that we're able to, uh, to reduce the total volume of runoff when we can increase soil organic matter. So uh, with some research that was done at K-State, uh, NRCS came out with a little graphic that says for every 1% uh, increase in soil organic matter, you're actually able to infiltrate and store an additional 25,000 gallons of water per acre. So that's about an inch of water. So if you think about it, um, if, you can, if you can do some of these practices and, and improve just 1% organic matter, you essentially have eliminated um, a, a whole set of runoff events that would have even occurred in a year where you previously needed uh, only a half inch of rain to generate runoff. You'll now need an inch and a half of rain. Think of all of the rainfall events between a half inch and one and a half inches. We also know that with those very large events, you're still going to generate runoff, but the more that we can infiltrate and store, the less mechanism we have to transport that water and the associated sediment and nutrients off the edge of the field. He's our good friend here, Peter Donovan, with the Soil Carbon Coalition. Uh, he's gone around uh, all around North America in a school bus doing infiltration tests for producers, talking about the value to those producers being able to infiltrate that water, to be able to use it when they need it. So we know that, that, that this lack of infiltration is really a problem. Um, we've got some plot level work that's been done in K-State, not published yet. Um, I'm not really supposed to be showing it to a lot of people yet. But, but you know, what, what we're really seeing there is that in these no-till cover crop systems, um, some, some interesting things are going on when we view just the, the, the runoff, the, the hydrographs. Um, you know, we see with conventional systems a, a, a very high peak flow um, from those events we also see an associated crash with those events that, that, that's very flashy and that you know, we, we, the flow then goes very low. When we, when we look at the, the no-till cover crop systems, uh, we see a much lower peak, which is great. We know that that's less energy um, that, that's being transported off the field. But almost as importantly, we're not seeing as quick or as steep a reduction in flow. We're actually able to flatten out that hydrograph pretty significantly. Now we don't really see it a lot at large scale yet, but we're, we know that it has real impacts. The state of Kansas has a tremendous amount of, of um, sediment loading that comes from stream bank erosion. And, and it's our theory and, and we surmise that, you know, if we're really able to see some of this type of effect from implementing enough soil health uh, principle type systems in a watershed, that we really could do a couple of great things for stream banks. One, not have that peak flow that will cut the bank and, and, and take that sediment away. But almost, again, as importantly, is one thing we see is we get a lot of stream bank um, collapse from, from the drop. It's when those, satur when those banks become saturated and you get the drop, you now have a very heavy bank. You do not have the water that's actually pushing against the bank and supporting it and we get that collapse effect, and we know a lot of stream bank erosion happens um, in that way as well. So we do believe that, uh, that soil health can have a big impact on, on our stream bank uh, erosion in Kansas. And we know that, uh, that, uh, that grazing can have huge impacts. Um, when we can get cattle out of these confined or unconfined type of feeding systems that denude uh, the ground cover, um, and, and it does that in a number of ways. First of all, we, we, you know, we relocate and just better distribute that manure and urine. Um, we also inoculate the soil with, with really good biology. The same biology that lives in the soil lives in the guts of, of, of you know, herbivores. And so um, you're actually doing a really good thing. And all of these soils um, in the state of Kansas and really throughout the, you know, the agricultural um, systems in our country you know, really developed under grazing pressure from, from large herbivores. And so getting cattle back out on those systems can have real nice effects. You know, we talked a little bit about how one of the best things we can do for our perennial systems to increase soil health is to let those systems rest, to get cattle off of those systems. And so, you know, when we can get cattle out on cover crops uh, in, in some of these soil health systems, 
um, you know, we can have some real good effects there. And, you know, so, I, you know, I, I ask you, you know, which of these systems, you know, do you think has happier cattle? You know, which one of these systems do you think is better for water quality? Um, you know, and finally, and probably most importantly, which one of these systems uh, is more profitable for the farmer? Because ultimately, that's what we're really talking about here. You know, for, you know, we talk about this new approach to conservation. What we've really done over time is taken a, a, a reductionist look at conservation. If you will reduce a little bit of the area that you farm, then we can put in a conservation practice and we can reduce a little bit the amount of sediment and nutrients that come off the edge of your field. And while that was the best we knew at the time, we now know better. That if we ever want to get out there and touch the acres that we need to touch to truly improve water quality from our, our agricultural watersheds, we have to find win-win situations. We have to find practices that improve soil health, that, that gain the load reductions that we talk about to improve water quality, but ultimately are profitable for the producer. And I really believe that these soil health principles can help get us there. That when we're able to actually build wealth in the soil, that we're, we will see profit above the soil. And all of the principles actually have ways in which we can profit. When we reduce disturbance, we reduce the input costs. We're not buying diesel to pull a vertical tailage tool around all day. When we can, when we can grow cover crops and companion crops and get more diversity in these systems, we can diversify our income sources. I talked to a producer not long ago. Uh, you know, they were growing cover crops. They had folks that wanted to bring in all kinds of honeybees. They actually made almost as much selling honey last year as they did growing corn. That's very important to producers right now. Again, when you're able to reduce fertilizers, herbicides, and insecticides, these synthetic chemicals, you reduce those input costs, but it's, it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. That the more that you can reduce these synthetic inputs, you're able to build soil health more quickly, and it's very cyclical. It's a hard first step to take, but once you're on that system, uh, you can see some real benefits. And finally, when you can take pounds of beef or pounds of pork or pounds of poultry, off of this cropland, you're actually stacking enterprises on each acre. You're able to profit more on an acre-by-acre -acre basis each year and improve your profitability. So, you know, this, this soil health movement, uh, it's happening right now. Um, you can't open a farm magazine right now without reading an article about soil health. And, and actually, more often than not these days, you know, it's on the cover. And you know, there, there are great people associated with the soil health movement. Some of the, the key leaders in the United States, these folks have all been in the state of Kansas in the past year. Um, and, and these folks, they're great people. They will, they will take a phone call. Any one of us here could call them. They would be happy to talk with you as long as you wanted about, about what they can help us learn about soil health. Abe Collins, Gabe Brown, Jonathan Lundgren, Dave Brandt, Ray Archuleta. Um, you know, these guys, they're around. They're, they're out there. They are available. Everybody in this room, should you want them to come and talk about soil health, they are more than willing. We have some great opportunities in the state of Kansas. Uh, an organization called No-Till on the Plains has an annual conference every year in Wichita, Kansas. Um, uh, High Plains Journal has started another conference called Soil Health U. Um, and, and we're just unbelievably blessed in Kansas to have some of the producers that we do that are working with our watershed groups. Um, and that we're able to just build great relationships with Darren Williams, Shane New, Sean Tiffany, Lucinda Stunkel, Dale Strickler, Gail Fuller, um, John Stiggy. I mean, th these are great folks that, uh, that are working with our watershed groups. They're helping our folks understand the need to improve soil health, and, and they're doing a great job for us. We're really lucky to have them. And so with that, you know, we're really excited about where soil health can go. Uh, in the state of Kansas, um, and we are seeing some some amazing things out there. Um, I'll be honest, a lot of those amazing things are still at the field scale. We do not have enough implementation yet that we're we're seeing large watershed um, water quality improvements, but we'll get there. We're going to keep working. This has the opportunity, but but we all have to work together, and uh, and I do think we'll get there. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to have any questions. I have a two-part question. First, I want to know how much acreage
percentage-wise in Kansas, would you say is is no-till? And my second question is, why is it so low? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because, um, I mean, I was taught this 30 year, 35 years ago in college. We were talking about this. And every time I come, I'm a little bit, like, disappointed and kind of very confused at why we're not more advanced now, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, th th that's kind of a loaded question. I think there's a lot of factors in play, and I probably can't touch on them all. I think a couple of the biggest. Um, one was that no-till in and of itself was kind of an incomplete practice. Um, there were some things going on there, you know, you, without ever incorporating some of that crop residue, um, you're, you know, you're, you're leaving a lot of that set on the soil surface, which we think is good. The problem that we had is the biology was not responding to just that crop residue. And so without the biology to process and cycle a lot of that biomass on the surface, um, you know, we built up a, a, lot, of, a lot of crop residue, um, but it's really the biology below ground that, that we need uh, to stimulate, and, and no-till in and of itself just doesn't do that. I also think technology played a role um, in that, you know, when producers were going to uh, no-till, you know, 20 years ago, uh, they were going out there with a regular uh, planter. They were, you know, they had some spring downforce technology, um, and, and they didn't even know how to set that planter up to get a good stand up. Um, that's completely changed. We're to the point now where we have planters that have independent downforce, independent row downforce technology. Um, and so, you know, with, with, with the, the GPS and some of the data processing capabilities that we have, they're now in the cab um, and on the planter. Um, we're able to see stands, uh, you know, even of corn, that are planted no-till that, that are just as good as any type of strip-till or conventional till systems. So I, I, you're right. Um, it, it's not good, but I do think that um, you know everything that we talk about here, the, the, the ideas of, of agroecology, um, but also using technology can, can really increase uh, the adoption of, of just regular no-till in the future. Great presentation. I love to talk about soil health, but last February we saw a presentation from Gail Fuller, um, who's an amazing producer in central Kansas. And one of the things, you know, he's really kind of drunk the soil health Kool-Aid and started brewing it himself, I think. Um, but he talked about that he was really interested in almost obsessively instrumenting his operation in order to collect <laughs> data. And I wondered whether he'd had any success in finding funding. But I throw that out there, um, is that there are, for people who are looking for um, cooperators and, and producers to collect data from, I think he would be an amazing partner to work with in that kind of collect data collection opportunity. Yeah, so, uh, you know, so uh, Gail's farm um, is about a mile and a half down the road from my great-grandparents' farm, and uh, so, you know, I've known the Fullers for a long time, and, uh, you know, and, and so I'll say this in, you know, the nicest way. Um, Gail's a nut. <laughs> <laughs> I love him to death, and, and, you know, the system that you described, um, you know, they're out there trying to find funding for a, um, a monitoring system that really the, the entire point is what we heard about the other day, trying to quantify ecosystem services that are derived from these types of systems. And ultimately, I think we'll have to get there. Um, if we're ever going to truly value these types of systems for what they should be valued for, you know, obviously I couldn't get into it today, but there's all kinds of, of uh, you know, resiliency, flood mitigation, climate change, uh, rural development um, issues that, are, that come into play when you implement these types of systems, and, and you know, it, it really doesn't have an end. Uh, you know, I tell people, you know, soil health is not a silver bullet um, for the problems of rural America, but it's probably the closest thing that we've ever seen to that. Um, and we need to really keep working. Um, and, and Gail's right out on the leading edge of that. We've we've tried um, to help him get some of the funding for that. Um, we've promised him a little 319 funding if he can scrape some more together. Um, and they're working on it. And in fact, Gabe Brown up in North Dakota um, has that system in place at the moment. Um, Gabe uh, was able to find the funding. There's some more corporate interest up there. Gail still, and Shane New is another producer in Kansas, um, trying to do that same thing. They're, they're still looking for some of the corporate um, funding to try to get those systems in place. But it's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, I'm over here. Um, yeah. And uh, how much uh, work do y'all do on uh, grazing land? Because you mentioned perennial pasture. 
I know I've worked uh, with uh, folks in Texas who are uh, they're grazing using intensive grazing on perennial what we call improved pasture, and they're starting to see uh, native uh, grasses and native plants come in and respond to, to that grazing. Are you are y'all seeing that in Kansas? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So in Kansas, we're split fairly evenly uh, between cropland and uh, and. Uh, you know perennial grass systems, and so it's it's tremendously important to improve the soil health of those systems as well. And you're exactly right that these types of managed uh, grazing um, can really improve soil health. And, and what we mean when we say managed grazing is is trying to get back to the idea that you don't just dump a pot of cows out in a pasture of, of you know 160 acres and let them go around and pick just what they want to eat. Um, what we try to do is we try to um, do higher density grazing. We try to um, as wolves would have naturally herded the bison together um, into more tight bunches. Um, we try to use hot wire fence to, to get animals closer together um, for higher intensity, but we leave them there for a shorter duration. And then again, it's the rest system in these perennial systems that really allows that grass to re regrow, revegetate. Um, and when you do that in a very randomized nature, um, you'll see that there's all kinds of diversity that'll come back and that, uh, you know, by randomizing, um, you know, kind of how you're doing things in those systems, you can see uh, huge benefits. And so that's, that's a key for us as well. And, and, you know, to be honest, a lot of the, you know, the, the ranchers, the cattlemen in Kansas, um, they buy off on these concepts sometimes easier than the row crop guys do. Um, you mentioned the potential profitability for farmers moving from confined to grazing systems. And my question to you is, do you have a sense of how long it might take for a farmer to be able to make a switch like that and become profitable, knowing that they had equipment, you know, for the other system and now you're talking about different equipment, you know, for some of these new techniques? And also, second question is, uh, does Kansas have any kind of financial incentives or programs to help farmers that might want to do that? Yeah, so, you know, to, to answer your first question, um, you know, the answer is one year, right now. If, if you want to get out and start grazing cover crops and, and say you're a rancher that doesn't own a tractor, you don't own uh, a, a drill to plant a cover crop, um, chances are there's somebody around that does. And, and helping make these connections is one of the things that, that our watershed coordinators are trying to do right now um, and, and making sure that you know, the, the, the market is there for producers. If a guy's row crop, um, you know, it's going to take, a, and he's not going to graze a cover, it's going to take a few years to start seeing some of these input costs go down to the point that he's going to pencil it out as profitable. But if you can graze it right now, you can see profitability in year one. And it's really about making the connections in the agricultural communities to get the right people talking to each other to make that happen. There's just simply no way to feed cattle all winter long in, in any type of situation, um, you know, whether you're feeding hay, you're feeding grain, you're burning a lot of gas, you're burning a lot of diesel all winter long. If you have cattle doing what they're designed to do, and that is be out in a field grazing, then, then they're making money for you. Um, and so you can, you can see that profit right now. And, and to your question on the incentives, yeah, there are a lot of incentives. And, and you know, certainly um, USDA and RCS has has a lot of great programs. Um, they have an entire initiative or divisions now devoted to soil health. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of equip applications for uh, cover crops. We're seeing a lot of CSP applications for cover crops, and I'm not exactly sure you know, how CSP is going to shake out um, in the in the next farm bill. But you know, my you know my family farm, for instance, we've planted uh, cover crops under CSP contracts. Um, and then with our wraps program, we're uh, we're uh, spending a significant amount of our uh, funding every year for uh, soil health principles. Uh, and, and again, it, it really gets back to the idea that you know, we've neglected the foundation of conservation for far too long. And, and I, I want everyone to be clear that conservation systems ultimately are what will improve water quality. But we've been doing these other things for so long. We need to focus on the foundation now. That's where we need to focus our time and our funding right now is to getting soil health improved on as many acres as we can. 
And, and so, you know, we're trying to do some innovative things that maybe USDA can't at the moment. Um, you know, a big one there that we're allowing RAFS groups to do is to, is to put permanent water sources on cropland situations. You know, the biggest challenges that you have to grazing a cover crop are do you have fence around that crop field and how are you going to water those cattle? Well, if we can provide some incentive for producers um, you know, to have a hot wire fence around that field, if we can put a water source out on that crop field, then they can start seeing profit from that day one. And it's that win-win situation, I think, that will ultimately drive the change that we're going to need to see out there. We've got to touch a lot of acres. You know, the state of Kansas has, has you know, 46 million acres in, in, of working lands, of, of, of ranches or farms. Um, we need to touch a lot of acres. And the only way to do that is for it to be profitable for producers, those win-win situations. So we're going to do everything we can to try and help foster that and push it along. All right. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great way to end the conference. Uh, we're not going to keep you here too long, but uh, a couple of farewell words before we go. Linda? <laughs> not going to keep you sitting here for too long. I just wanted to say, wow, <laughs> what an incredible suite of presentations over the last three days. Um, really inspiring and informative and engaging. So um, we're going to do a big round of applause at the end um, for everyone. Um, but I did want to just um, you know, say thank you so much, all of you, for all that you do um, and all of your work. We work in a field that has just enormous challenges. It can seem overwhelming. Um, and I think what we've seen here these last th three days is just, you know, smart people, strong alliances, strategic approaches, working hard, just sheer stick to itiveness to get things done and get water quality improved. And um, so I thank you for that. Um, thank you all for your attention. You guys have been so engaged right through to the last um, morning. Um, I'm sure the speakers appreciate it. I certainly did it. It just enhanced the learning and the energy. So shout out to all of you as well. So um, one last round of thank yous. Planning team, awesome job. James Plummer and the team at Newipick, fantastic. <laughs> Thank Barry again, um, team at Region 8, Peter Monahan and Judy Bloom, thank you. And <laughs> last but not least, Lisa Hare and the rest of the crew at the Nonpoint Source Management Branch and EPA headquarters, all of whom worked very hard on this as well. Thanks, everyone. Safe travel. I'd like to echo Linda's thanks to all of you for your participation and attention. And additionally, I'm going on vacation next week, uh, hanging out in Colorado. So um, presentations will be posted in the next few weeks, um, as well as the webinar recordings. And if you need anything else from me, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll respond to it on the 19th. <laughs> Thank you.